All right, are we about ready to go? Hi, I'm Brian Dale. I'm in the Office of Field Policy Management here with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We're so glad to have you all here. I work for John, and uh, we had a couple of uh, um, partners that wanted to just give us a couple of uh, pieces of information here. First, I'm going to introduce Roger Howard from the Living Independence Network Corporation, and he's going to talk to us about uh, the, the, the loan closet, right? Hi, folks. Uh, again, Roger Howard with Link. A lot easier to remember than Living Independence Network Corporation. We're the Center for Independent Living here in Boise that works with people with any kind of disabilities uh, to provide advocacy and community supports. Um, and what I wanted to ask real quickly was we have a program where we collect and repurpose and recycle and refurbish uh, accessibility equipment of any type. Uh, and in particular, we get a lot of requests uh, when we're helping people, for instance, redo their bathrooms in their homes to make them wheelchair accessible uh, for grab bars. So I just wanted to say if anybody's working on any kind of projects, you know, whether they're renovating a hotel or something like that, if you come up with any kind of, of used things like grab bars, uh, uh, you know, toilets that are, are 19 inches high and that seethe and things like that, we'd be glad to take those off your hands and get them into the hands of folks that could use them. So uh, <clears throat> we'll, I'll put some business cards out on the table if you want to grab one of those on your way out. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. And uh, also, uh, we're, we um, wanted to hear from Eric Kingston who's with Idaho Housing Finance Association, and also with a, a newer organization called Ramp Up Idaho. And I'm gonna let Eric explain what that is, and I'm gonna get out of the camera shot. Okay, I'm gonna be really quick here. I've got the uh, Idaho Fair Housing Forum website up, up here on the screen for you to take a look at. This is the portal that a lot of people around the state use to get in and see the webcast today. Um, but it's a lot more than that, so I just wanna make sure you guys are aware of uh, what's on there. So um, there is a search, search field here. Uh, you can search for any term you're looking for. I've just typed in city and county. Um, one of the things that we've uh, got loaded on there is information, uh, what every city and county needs to know. So folks who are building officials, planners, uh, elected officials, what we've done is ca uh, kind of collected all the information from our 2011 analysis of impediments uh, that was done statewide. And that's, um, it's got information that's really relevant to uh, you know, city and county uh, planners and folks like that. So, so I encourage you to check that out. There's a lot on that website. There's a glossary and, and uh, glossary of terms. Um, we try to post things like this, any kind, any kind of training that's coming up. And we've got a lot of Fair Housing uh, Forum partners in the room. If you guys would raise your hands, folks that are part of that. Intermountain Fair Housing Council, Gary Haynes, Jerome from the city of Boise, uh, Dana, Roger, up there, and Dan and Roger, uh, Jennifer, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big crew. So um, our, our uh, kind of objective really is to get a lot of stakeholders at the table and talk about what our common interests are and, and how each of us can uh, kind of affect change and do some affirmatively furthering fair housing around the state. That's um, kind of what we're all about. And then the other project that uh, Brian mentioned, this is sort of a, you know, kind of an offshoot of uh, a statewide effort that works in rural communities. Uh, we noticed uh, at a review in Driggs, Idaho a few years ago that um, some of the downtown businesses weren't accessible. And uh, Brian was actually there and we were um, trying to get in and, and uh, get something to drink after, the, after a long day of, of being in the community. And uh, it occurred to us that, that um, that's not just a barrier to people like Brian or Dana or Jack it's also a barrier to commerce and, and a barrier to economic development. So um, we're, we're approaching this from that perspective. It's, it's an ADA requirement, but this is sort of, a, we look at this as a gateway topic, and we try to educate small businesses and um, tax advisors and, and communities that there are tax incentives for small businesses that want to remove barriers. So I'd encourage you to, um, we've got lots of these brochures down here. Um, I'll leave them on the table out there if you want to grab one on your way out. Um, so that's it. Any, any questions on those two programs? 
All right, good deal. Can you get me some answers? I can do that. Terrific. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, uh, I'm on the uh, Idaho Community Review Team through Idaho Rural Partnerships, and we, we visited American Falls a few years ago, and they were able to kind of parlay that site visit into a downtown revitalization grant and a transportation grant, it's Tiger 3 grant, I think it's 2.6 million. So they've been using that for a lot of downtown um, infrastructure projects. So that's one of the out outcomes of that project there. Okay, is that it? <coughs> Thanks. Welcome back, folks. And it looks like we've got a pretty good number that actually returned. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. This afternoon, we ended actually this morning, we ended uh, right before bathrooms. We have a detailed deep dive discussion this afternoon, 90 minute discussion planned for bathrooms. So I thought we'd pick it all up there at the end. So we're going to look at three different modules this afternoon. We're going to start with uh, accessible public and common use areas. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to start with accessible routes and then we're going to uh, go to accessible public and common use areas and then we're going to end on bathrooms. So any questions you have this morning I'm willing to take. Um, we will be reviewing three of those or at least two of those sessions. Uh, so we've got a uh, hand up here and uh, one from the remote web. Go ahead. Um, remotely, uh, looking at the bathrooms, if a window is placed above the tub, does it need to be accessible? Uh, under the Fair Housing Act, uh, windows are not covered, and so if that, the answer to that would be no in terms of the Fair Housing Act. The local code may have a different standard, but the Fair Housing Act would not address that window. My, my question is, is asking uh, regarding rumors that I've heard with the Fair Housing Act and from time to time perhaps individuals who may uh, visit a property, a multifamily property and note what they perceive to be as a violation and you've mentioned many times I've been an expert witness for the defendant or an expert witness for the plaintiff and the Department of Justice and the lawyers this and the lawyers that. I guess in your experience, have there been individuals around the country who, um, for better lack of a term, maybe make a living or as their hobby, uh, um, go into these properties, find perceived violations, and file complaints? And if so, um, is, is, it, is it possible that these individuals might themselves be personally enriched uh, financially because of that? Um, in terms of uh, these enforcements and, and, and can, you, can you speak to, to that legal process and, and, and financial remuneration and, and if, if that is a problem uh, regarding um, compliance? Well, I am an architect. I uh, am, am, not, am not an attorney. Um, I think I know what you're talking about and I have heard of those rumors regarding the ADA. I have not heard about that regarding the FHA, Fair Housing Act. Uh, that has not been an issue. Now, I'm quick to point out that uh, in terms of defending that sort of behavior, that people have a private right of action in this country. And if they don't uh, abuse that private right of action, then I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, do people abuse it? That could happen. Is it in, sometimes inappropriate? That, that might be. Uh, but people do have some, I mean, some of the, you know, the best advances I've seen in my, uh, in my region is a result of people complaining and litigating about uh, noncompliance under the, under the ADA, about ADA issues. I have not heard about this under the Fair Housing Act. Is it possible that they, the, the ones that file the complaint? Under the ADA, it's my understanding, under the federal ADA, there's very little likelihood of that. Right? Attorneys can get attorney fees. But if I were to be going around uh, suing at the drop of a hat, uh, 
it depends on how inappropriate they are. I mean, if, if somebody wants to say, I threaten a lawsuit unless you give me $5,000, and somebody gives them $5,000, are they remunerated? Yes. And is that inappropriate? It is, in my opinion. Uh, so can it happen? Could it happen? I suppose, yeah. Uh, but I haven't heard it happening with the Fair Housing Act. Any other questions about this morning's? Terrific, then let's, let's get started. We're gonna talk about accessible routes. Um, we've, we've already talked about an overview of the Fair Housing Act. What we wanna do is get to an overview of the requirements. Does anybody have a question about this particular slide? This is one of the most important slides in the, in the presentation. Uh, I had just had a question this, just a second ago that if a, a project was being built and it started construction, let's say, in January of, of uh, 1991, is it required to comply? And it's my understanding that it's designed and constructed for first occupancy after March 13, 1991. So if it's construction has started pre previous to this date, but first occupancy is, gonna, is going to happen after this date, then it's covered. It's about occupancy, not about permit, building permit dates, that sort of thing. It's about when it becomes occupiable, when occupancy occurs. We talked about the seven requirements. We're gonna go into a deep discussion about that. We talked about the 10 different safe harbors. And these are the ones we are using, the uh, accessibility guidelines for this session, ANSI 1986. And the design manual, that's what we're using. That's what this uh, PowerPoint is based on. So now we're gonna talk about requirement number one, accessible building entrance on an accessible route and accessible public and common use areas. Uh, the standard for this is ANSI. The high, it's a very high level of accessibility that is provided uh, under accessible routes in public and common use areas. Um, and we talked about the, the breakdown of ANSI. ANSI doesn't really scope corrective actions. It talks about this is the area of the, of the building development that's covered. This under ANSI 86 is the section number. And then this is the scoping requirement. This will tell you how many units are, are required to be covered, where they are. You know, we talk about, let's say, for example, recreation areas. It talks about how many are recreation areas? If you've got three swimming pools, are they all covered? Gives you information about that. So it talks about the technical provisions for accessibility here, how you make it accessible, and then over here, what is required to be accessible, how many and where they're required to be located. Planning. I touched a little bit on this this morning when we talked about, let's say, for example, that tennis court. We had a tennis court at the bottom of a cliff and we had to get an accessible route, either pedestrian route, or if the <coughs> slope of that route exceeded 8.33%, we, we could use an exception of vehicle route to get down to that. Both of those could create problems, all right? The solution was to understand at the very beginning of the planning process that a tennis court was gonna be a part of this uh, development, and where's the best place for it? And we looked at this and we decided that the best place for this was between the two buildings, not at the bottom of the cliff. That sort of thinking ahead, understanding what these requirements are well before you start planning, is critically, or before you start constructing, is crit critically important. It is a whole lot cheaper to erase a line than it is to remove a sidewalk and replace that in a different location because of a slope issue. So planning is critical. And steep slopes can be dealt with easily in, in uh, planning. I mean, here, I mean, look at this. Just by laying this parking lot, a, a lot out in a way that we've got our accessible parking here, right here, close to the entrance of the building, you come down a sidewalk and it takes you into this, this area. Thinking about this, these are all sloping sites. That's okay, this slopes up, this slopes up. But we have a five foot deep level area right in front of the door. We have a level platform here because we're coming up this slope. We've got to make a turn to get in that. This area has to be level or we continue on this sidewalk. 
thinking about all of this up front, understanding what the requirements are up front, incorporating it in the design, civil engineers and architects, can make this a very, very simple process. But it requires understanding and it requires planning and understanding this during the planning process. Let's talk about accessible routes. From site access points, we are required to have an accessible route, at least one that takes us to the entrance of every covered dwelling unit. Right? So for this is a building that contains covered dwelling units on the first floor. So we need to get from this bus stop and this sidewalk, that public street, to that entrance. And once we get through that entrance, we need to get to all of the units on that particular floor. Again, if we had a connection right here, then this route would serve this building as well as that building. Since we don't have a connection here, then we're required to have a site access point and a connection down this sidewalk out to this bus stop and that public sidewalk as well. Okay. Every, if there is public transportation, public right of way that serves the, uh, the, the, uh, the development, then we need an accessible route from each, one, each type of uh, access point, parking, public right of way, streets, public transportation, at least one route that gets us to every covered building. And then from the covered buildings, we need an accessible route that gives us to the site amenities. In this case, a swimming pool. This is maybe a, a, a changing area. That, that, that structure would require to be accessible, bathroom. Uh, this is a playground. And we talked about the tennis court and the fact that we had steep sites here. So we could either provide an accessible route, pedestrian route down here, or a vehicular route this is greater than 8.33 and outside of the control of the owner. That's a critical, critical statement. If, a, if the owner could have made it accessible, then they probably should have. Right? But again, this is a clear case that if this tennis court had been placed in this area right here, we wouldn't have to worry about that if there is nothing else down there. Okay. Accessible routes, at least 36 inches wide. And that is the actual that is the actual width of the accessible uh, 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 part of that sidewalk. So 36, at least 36 inches wide. Slopes between 0 and 5% are uh, walkways. Okay. Anything 5%, uh, over 5% is considered a ramp. Up to 8.33% is considered, between 5 and 8.33% is considered a ramp. Uh, ramps are steep. Difficult for some people to use. I like to avoid the use of them. But if you have to provide a ramp, remember that you can't have a run of ramp greater than 30 feet in length at 8.33% without a level area at the top and the bottom. So as I said this morning, if I've got a 42 inch level change and I'm gonna do that with a ramp, I'm gonna have at least a five foot level area in the middle of that ramp and I'm gonna have a five foot level area at the bottom and a five foot level area at the top. So that's an additional 15 feet on that 40, that 42 inch ramp, which if I do the math is, it increases that compliance area by, by what, almost 35, 40%, all right? So if there's any way you could have gotten a slope of 5% in there, I think that is a better solution. But again, that requires thinking about this when you're designing it. You know, you want to think about these things during design, during the planning phase, not afterwards. Cross slope. Cross slope of accessible routes can't exceed 2%. We're 1 in 50, 1 in 48. Um, some people think that's a tough standard. Uh, I, I'm not one of them. I think that if people are paying attention, it is easy to design and construct to this particular standard, this 2% cross slope. It's been in the books for years and years and years. It, it's been a standard. It's, it's a settled argument, in my opinion, that 2%, the maximum slope of 2%. It allows somebody to push great distances without um, exhaustion. Let's say I had a sidewalk that had a 5% cross slope. Most people think 5% doesn't sound bad. Well, let's say I'm in the last building and I have to go get my mail every day. Right? And that last building is, let's say, it's 1,500 feet to get from that building to the mail kiosk and 1,500 feet back. That's 3,000 feet, right? That's a little bit more than a half a mile. And it's, this is not unusual. 
a little bit more than a half an hour, a mile to go from uh, the, 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 my unit, since this is all about me, from my unit to the mail kiosk and then from the mail kiosk and back. If I'm dealing with a cross slope of 5%, what happens is I push down the sidewalk, my front caster wheels want to go down that cross slope. They tend to go down. And I counter that by braking with this other hand. So if this is the high side and this is the low side, I'm braking with this hand and I'm pushing with this hand. That means to go that little over a half a mile, I am pushing up a ramp. Remember, a ramp starts at 5%. I'm pushing up a ramp with one hand. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is difficult. And it's tiring. And this is an invisible barrier that people don't see and don't recognize. Cross slope is a big deal. It's not about convenience. It's about making things possible. I would not be able to push over a half a mile uh, to pick up my mail uh, if the cross slopes exceed, you know, if they exceed 2%, because I just, I can't do it with one arm anymore. Back in the old days when I was a kid, I could do it. But I can't do it anymore. And there's a lot of people that can't do that. So cross slope is important. Deal with it in your design. Call it out. For those of you that are designing civil engineers, make sure that the contract understand, contractor understands what this maximum slope is. And make sure they understand how important it is to you, because it's your liability out there. And, and make sure that as they're building it, you inspect it. And it gets done. An example in Chicago is, there were a lot of site inspections, a lot of uh, sidewalk inspections when they were first resolving this litigation. And there was a lot of construction that was torn out and redone. Right? The second year, it went in pretty well. The third year, they were getting it right. And ever since then, it's been six or seven years now, the contractors in the city of Chicago understand this. Our standard is not 2%, it's 1.5. We build in a construction tolerance. So when it's a little bit off, it's still compliant. And it's really easy to use. And I now find myself pushing from point A to point B in the city, when before I had to call up a special van service to pick me up, and sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. It's expensive. But now I'm a pedestrian like anybody else in most of the city of Chicago because a lot of the sidewalks and curb ramps are fully compliant now. So it's very, very beneficial to me. And it's all about me, remember? All right, ground surfaces. I'm sorry about that. Ground surfaces. Um, Firm, stable, and slip resistant. What is a firm, stable, and slip resistant exterior surface? Generally, it's going to be concrete, asphalt, boards. You can, you know, uh, decking. Um, flagstone and stone pavers are OK, in my opinion. A lot of people don't like them. I think if you use a stone paver and you are careful about the transitions from one stone to the other, so that we don't have vertical level chains that we talked about this morning that exceed a quarter of an inch. Right? It's OK if they're set in a way, in a substrate, that will maintain that flush surface. That's important. I see a lot of times where brick pavers are set just in sand. And within a year or two, they're all over the place. And they're not compliant. They're not accessible anymore. But if that substrate is done correctly, I have seen pavers in my my uh, condominium building, the pavers have been there since 1983, and there's not, they're perfect. They're in perfect shape. Our driveway and our walkways around my building are all brick pavers, and they're in perfect shape, and they've never been, never had to maintain them because they installed them appropriately the first time. So as long as we can maintain that flush surface and we don't have gaps, we don't have vertical level changes, I think there's nothing wrong with using pavers as a surface. What we can't use is, is grass surfaces. We can't use gravel surfaces. There has recently, the US Access Board has finished uh, a research project with the National Center on Accessibility out of Indiana, uh, University of Indiana in Bloomington, where they looked over many years, they looked at different natural surfaces, decomposed granite surfaces, that type of thing. And I think that this study will be used to inform, I'm hoping it's going to be used to inform standards that will be, uh, or guidelines that will be developed by the access boards and standards that will be adopted eventually by Justice and HUD and others. So that we can, because I think it's possible to do this, we can have a natural permeable surface, exterior surface, that meets accessibility standards. I, I think it's well, it's possible. 
right now, there are none. There are no natural surfaces other than what I talked about, pavers, decking, concrete, asphalt, that does it. Now, this morning I mentioned that the guidelines are basically written for somebody who uses a wheelchair, and, th and that's true. There are some provisions for blind and visually impaired, and this is one of them. These are protruding objects. A person using a cane, getting from point A to point B, is generally going to use, when there's a wall, that wall is what they call a shoreline. A cane, they will be maybe 10, 12 inches. They try to get you know, 6 to 12 inches out from that wall, um, and they'll use the the, the wall as a shoreline with their, with their cane. Well, if something is projecting out from that wall, let's let me just let me use right here as an example. Let's say we just had a banner, some sort of sign that is sticking out at the base of its hair and goes up this high and comes back. Well, this fella is going to find that sign with his face, not his cane, right? The cane is, the, 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 the wall can tell him what way he's going, but if there's something projecting off the wall, that the cane doesn't detect, he or she is going to run into it. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to make sure that there is something, if the projection is more than four inches off the wall, if it's more than four inches, then at the bottom of that projection, there needs to be some sort of warning device so that the cane can pick up the fact that something's projecting off that wall 27 inches above the, the floor or ground or lower. All right? If this bottom leading edge was higher than 27 inches, the cane's not necessarily going to find it. You know? But if it's projecting less than 4 inches, that's fine. But if it's, if it's projecting more than 4 inches, then we're going to have to have some barrier below that is cane detectable. And where we see this in housing a lot is the stairs to the second floor of a three-story walk-up. Right? You've got a breezeway, you've got a set of stairs in that breezeway that takes you up to the second floor, another set that takes you up to the third floor. And if you're walking, again, if you're walking under, down that breezeway and you're not aware that there are stairs there, this fellow, again, is going to find the bottom of those stairs with his forehead before the cane's going to find them, right? Going to run right into them. So we need to have something fixed, permanent, that's located below those stairs, at least 27 inches high, so that's cane detectable. I think that's a great place to put a bike stand. And the bike then stand becomes the, the detectable warning. Right? But that's just my opinion. There's got to be something under those things. Curb ramps. These are three typical types of curb ramps. Um, we see them a lot. And I want to go into a little bit of detail about some of them. Let's talk about the first most common curb ramp we see, which is referred to as a flared curb ramp because of these sides, this side and this side. The curb ramp itself is this area right here. The maximum slope of that area is 8.33% uh, or 1 in 12, same, same thing. So if I have a 6 inch high curb, this run is 6 feet long, 6 feet. And at the top, I need to have a 48 inch deep level area. So if I'm using from the face of this curb to the back side of this is what? 10 feet. That's usually wider than sidewalks, perpendicular parking in a housing development. 10 feet is usually wider than, than what uh, is, is normally provided. Five feet, standard, six feet sometimes. So if we have a curb ramp, right, that is uh, that is 1 in 12, and we don't have 48 inches at the top that we can make for a level landing, then these side flares have to slope at the same slope as this running slope of the, of the ramp itself. So that means that this dimension from this point all the way out to the end of this flare on either side is at least, with a 6 inch curb, at least 6 feet long. And normally what you see is about an 18-inch side flare, right? If we have a level area at the top for it, then this becomes 1 in 10 instead of 1 in 12. So a 1 in 10 side flare at a 6-inch curb means the length of the running along the curb is 5 feet. And we don't see that either. 
So it is not uncommon to find these side flares are not compliant. It is not uncommon to find a curb ramp that is supposed to be six feet long because we're going up a six inch curb, but the width of the sidewalk is only five feet. So they just make the length of the curb ramp five feet instead of six feet. Well, it's too steep. It's not compliant. You can't even, you can't do anything with the side flares in that case. This has to be no steeper than 1 in 12, 8.33%. Okay? So if we got that, we don't have the level area at the top, we can make the side flares a little bit lower, 1 in 12 instead of 1 in 10. But this has to be, this has to be 8.33, uh, 1 in 12 maximum. We see a built-up curb ramp. This is where usually you got the, let's say, a five-foot wide sidewalk. We don't want to put a curb ramp in there and across the sidewalk like we did here because we know we're not going to be able to do it because it's five-foot sidewalk and I need at least six feet of ramp. So I come out into the, uh, into the surface here in this area and I provide a uh, built-up curb ramp. Well, that's okay, but what we find is that this side slope has to, just like this, now the side flare here has to be one in 10, maximum slope. And again, that means that on the six inch curb, this is five feet long, and this is five feet long. And this is a minimum width of an accessible route, which is three feet. So we have a 13 foot from this point to this point width. And people don't like doing that. So they just put a side flares in at 45 degrees and walk away from it. It's not compliant, right? Because the wheelchair can, front caster wheel gets on that steep slope and down they go and over they go. The other place where this becomes a problem is in an ADA parking space. So if we're providing a parking space to a leasing office and it has to comply with the ADA as well, um, the parking space and the access aisle that serves the accessible parking space under the ADA can't slope more than 2% in any direction. If this curb ramp is in that access aisle, it's clearly sloping more than 2%. So you can't use built-up curb ramps in ADA spaces. Okay? So be very, very careful. If, you could, if it's not an ADA space, if it's just an FHA space, a built-up curb ramp is probably okay under the standards that we're talking about today. Make sure the side flare is compliant. Make sure the side flare is compliant. If it's an ADA space, it's going to have to be either this type of curb ramp or this type of curb ramp. This is a returned curb ramp. When we don't have circulation that can walk across, not up and down the ramp, but across the ramp, like here, people are walking up and down the sidewalk. If we don't have that condition, we have planters, we have landscape, we have trees growing out here, then we can have a vertical side to the curb ramp. We don't need to have flared edges. They can, they can be vertical, but only when you cannot walk across. Anytime somebody can walk across, if, it, if it's the last foot of this, then that last foot's going to have to be flared. Right? So there's a lot of rules in curb ramps. There's a lot of rules that are broken in curb ramps. And curb ramps is one of the most common elements of an accessible environment, and it's commonly one of the most uh, violated elements within an accessible environment. Like I said, the city of Chicago, $50 million to identify non-compliant curb ramps and fix them. So here's all of the components together. Access aisle, curb ramp, on accessible route that takes us into, in this case, the clubhouse. If, notice this sign doesn't extend past that, that accessible route more than four inches, right? If that sign stuck out, his face would have found it if this person was blind or visually impaired because it's low enough to hit them in the face. If the bottom of that sign is above 80 inches, then it can stick out as far as you want it to, all right? So anywhere from zero to 80 inches, you gotta be aware of protruding objects and how to deal with them. Where are accessible routes required? We went through this this morning. From a pedestrian arrival areas, uh, bus stops, sidewalks, public streets, to the covered dwelling, from the covering to covered dwelling to site facilities and amenities, those that are covered, clubhouses, trash, mail kiosks, that sort of thing. And then within the covered dwelling unit, we're required to have an accessible route that connects the entrance 
to the, uh, to the different units. So here's our site access point. We have a requirement for an accessible route to lead from that site, site access point. So we're going to provide accessible parking here. This is parking that serves this building. This is our parking that serves this building. Since in this particular diagram we do not have a pedestrian route that, co that connects all of these buildings, then this building has to be served from this side access point to that building if we had a sidewalk that served all three buildings that connected these, then given the size of this, we may only need one or two accessible spaces and we wouldn't have to make a, uh, an accessible space at every parking lot. But because we don't have an accessible pedestrian route connecting all of these, then every site access point has to be compliant. Okay? We also have to get an accessible route from each one of these dwellings to the clubhouse, to the pool, to the changing station, this is a bus stop out here, so we need to get an accessible route from that bus stop to every one of these buildings. And in my opinion, you cannot use the driveway to do that. So this may look like a straightforward plan for fair housing compliance, but it doesn't provide the necessary accessible routes. And there, if we connected these with these, these dark lines, if we connected all of this, that would be fine. Because here now we have a route that connects us to this building, we have a route that connects us to this building, and when this building connects to all of these, that's fine. Remember this morning, and out to our bus station, that connects us to every one of these facilities. Remember this morning I said it's not necessary to have a route that connects A to B and B to C, but because of our network, we do have those. It just logically falls in place that you're going to get those accessible connections. And then once we're in the building, an accessible route to the units. Parking spaces. It is okay to provide parking spaces. You get out of the, you know, the vehicle and then you cross over the pedestrian route to get to your unit. All right? That's okay. But it's not okay to use, in my opinion, it's not okay to use this street or this driveway as your pedestrian route. Clearly you can cross it, but you can't use it. Um, uh, as, as your main pedestrian route. Steep sites, we've talked about this a couple of times. <coughs> accessible building entrances. Here's our accessible space, our five foot wide access aisle, a nice gentle ramp that takes us up and right into the building. This is well done. And this is a diagram of that same thing. Once we get inside, we get to the <coughs> corridor, we get to the, each one of these entrances. This secondary common entrance is not necessarily required to be compliant. We have a dumpster out here. If that's the closest entrance to that dumpster. Does that mean we have to make it compliant? Not necessarily. Is it a good idea? Yeah, it's a good idea. If the site is flat, it's a good idea. But I showed you a, a, a diagram this morning where we had five or six steps to get up to there. That's compliant. We could get to the dumpster by coming out here and, and using that route. Is that a circuitous route? I don't think so, not in my opinion. All right. But if I had to come out this door instead of down here, and I had to come out this door and come around here and come over here and go all the way down through the shopping center, all the way back to get to this point, that's a circuitous route. That's going to result in complaints. All right. Yes, sir? Correct. But it, what if you live down the next unit? I don't, I don't see a sidewalk along that opposite side there. Um, so does that, does that force you behind a parked car? Let's say I, let's say I'm going to use this entrance, and this is my only parking space. So I'm going to cross over, and then I'm going to go down here to get to that entrance. That's required to be an accessible route. So if this we don't have a connection here, right? right? So we're going to have to pour a little concrete here. We're going to have to get a little concrete here. We're going to have to ensure that this particular route that does that, if this is the only parking space, it isn't, as we can see. But if it were, we would have to provide an accessible route to get to each one of these entrances. All right? 
So this route could not cross more than slope, cross slope more than 2%. It doesn't look like running is going to be an issue here, but cross slope could be an issue. And we can't use these gravel uh, planting beds as part of our accessible route. And in my opinion, you can't come out here and go down the site and go down this street and into that because it's not safe, in my opinion. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, I, we've talked about this two or three times already today. This is about the vehicular exception. And I'll just remind you that if it's outside of the control of the owner, that you may be able to use the exception. Again, here we don't have, we have a typical breezeway building with just route, one route in. So from an, an accessible parking space, now each entrance is not required to be served by an accessible parking space. Right? And this, this is not to imply that it is, that this entrance is requires accessible parking and this one does too. Um, only 2% of those spaces that serve the covered dwelling units are required to be compliant. But we have one entrance here. If this came up, we came up here and we came around here and went through here to get us over here, that would be fine. That's what this additional width around the ramp is. Let's say this is my accessible route and I'm coming down here and I have to get to this building. If I have, remember the maximum cross slope of the accessible route can't be more than 2%. If I have a curb ramp that goes across the sidewalk and I have to get from the right side to the left side of that, I can't go across that curb ramp because that slope could be as steep as 8.33%. Okay. So I'm going to have to have some way to get around it or some curb ramp design that takes the sidewalk down to the level of the street, horizontal across that for whatever distance I need, and then the entire sidewalk can slope back up. It's called a parallel curb ramp. That is being allowed now by the new uh, 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 ADA standards. And so I think it would be perfectly appropriate here as well. But each one of these breezeway entrances has to be on an accessible route served by accessible parking. But that doesn't mean that both breezeway entrances are required to have accessible parking. But from one to get from one to that, you've got to provide an accessible route. Sometimes it's easier to provide accessible parking than it is accessible routes. Sometimes. Yes? The entrances to those units are right here, and here, and here, and here. Right. So you only have to have one entrance for all of those? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you have a minimum of one entrance. The question is, this diagram only has one entrance to get into these units. This is, this is an entrance to this unit. This is an entrance to that unit. This is an entrance to this unit. And this is an entrance to this unit. Mm -hmm. At a minimum, that's all you need, is one entrance to each one of the units. Well, I'm talking about the accessible walks. You said we only needed to have two accessible, or one accessible walk on that. To so each, but, but you have to have an accessible walk to each one of the covered dwelling units. So we have a walkway that gets us to these four entrances, right? Mm-hmm. And for some reason, I'm getting some feedback. I have a walkway that gets us to these four units. This same parking space, I can use this as my accessible entrance to get to these four units. So this one parking space serves eight units. OK, so you don't have to have the other parking space? This other parking space? Right. Maybe not. OK. You know, it's, again, 2% of the units. If we have okay. 100 covered units, and at a minimum, all we have to provide is two accessible parking spaces. Okay. It's not a high standard, but HUD is going to insist if anybody makes a request for an accommodation for additional accessible parking at their unit, HUD's going to enforce that. I mean, that, that's, that's a reasonable accommodation, and, uh, and it's easy to do. And here's another example. We have the one accessible parking space, and we have a route that takes us to that entrance, a route that takes us to that entrance, in here to this entrance. We can come over here and get to this entrance. If we didn't want this sidewalk here for some reason, because let's say it was real steep right here, 
we could come through and break through this little planting area to get to that entrance there. All right, there's more than one way to skin a cat. We talked about accessible buildings with multiple ground floors. If we have vehicular access at a level, that triggers it. And we'll talk a little bit about site and practicality later. There may be other things that trigger uh, this, but it is very, very, um, It's not unusual to have more than one level of a building be covered because of site access point issues. And here's all of the, uh, ex the elements together. This is the site access, uh, vehicular access point, a curb ramp, a route that takes us up to a level area in front of the door. And this is a good example of, uh, of a, uh, this is a four-story building which has three of those stories are covered stories, are required to have covered dwelling units in them, accessible or compliant dwelling units in them, because we have vehicular parking at the first floor, we have vehicular parking at the third floor, and we have vehicular parking at the fourth floor. So we have a bridge that leads from this parking structure over to the fourth floor, a bridge that leads from the third floor over, and then we have surface. So we have three covered floors. As I was indicating earlier, I've been, in, I've been in a building where we had these four floors. We had a, a bridge, it's only like a five foot long bridge, but it connected the second floor as well. And so I had a four story building with four ground floor units, or four ground floors on it. Because the parking structure, the vehicular arrival area led straight into it. Now if they didn't provide this bridge or this bridge, then and there's no elevator in this building, then the second, third, and fourth floor would not be covered. But because they provided the bridge, it was covered. Sorry, I'm having trouble with this. Okay. Let's talk about some examples of accessible routes. I talked about pavers and flagstone type of things. That's fine. I mean, as long as you be careful about how you set the stone so it stays in the position you want it to be in, if there's a good substrate and you're mindful of the transition from one stone to the other, so your mortar joints are flush with the top of the stone, you don't put in you know, one inch deep mortar joints, um, that's fine. You can do all of this. This is there's not a problem at all. One of the areas where we find that uh, this transition from this is a, just a sloping walk out onto the street Sometimes that transition can be a little problematic and you have to be careful about that. Particularly if, on a, if you're on an 8.33 ramp and somebody's going down a ramp and all of a sudden you've got a vertical level change with the asphalt, let's say, is an inch higher at the bottom of the ramp than the ramp is, that'll stop, cast your wheels dead, boom, and the person in the chair shoots out into the street. Not a condition you want. All right, so here's an accessible parking space access aisle, no curb at all. You just get in there and wander back into the development. It's a nicely done. We talked about this this morning. We have a building that has separate exterior entrances. So all of those ground floor entrances have to be on an accessible route. In this case, they used a bridge to do it. So let's talk about site and practicality. This looks like a pretty slopey site, right? I talked about at least one accessible route that connects all of these things. You could look at this right off the bat and say, I don't think this is compliant. That may not be true, right? This might be compliant. So let's talk about this. Uh, I went through quickly individual building tests this morning and the site analysis test. And I know you guys had questions about that. So raise those questions now if you want. I will again reiterate that the Fair Housing Act design manual, which you can download off of our website, um, provides the best explanation I've ever seen for site practicality. How to run the test, how to do it, what to look for. They, they did a very, very nice job on that. And anytime you think that you have a site and practicality issue, take the 15 minutes necessary, read through that, make sure that, uh, that you're, you're, you're confident in what your decisions you're making. So the first question is, there's two tests. Which test do we apply? Well, again, as I said this morning, 
if the building has an elevator that serves the covered dwelling units, the dwelling units, then the building, you cannot use a site, uh, site practicality test on that building. It is assumed that the, the building is sufficient in size uh, to mandate that there be at least one accessible route that connects the site access points to the building entrance. If we have only one entrance to a single building on a site, we use the individual building test. That's the only test you can use. And if it uh, fails the individual building test, if it, it proves to be too steep, then you, none of the units within that building are required to be compliant. But if we have two or more entrances to the building, or two or more buildings on the site, then you can use either one of the tests I'm going to talk about, but 20% of the units on the site are required to comply. At least 20%. At least 20%. So let's talk about the individual building test. This is a different diagram, but it talks about the undisturbed site. And again, we had a 50-foot radius around this point, remember? So he came out 50 feet. We drew a circle and we made sure that every uh, site access point, in that, in that case it would be the sidewalk, uh, that was in, within that 50 feet was covered. Now, if our parking lot is greater, is more than 50 feet away from the entrance point, then you, using a straight line, you measure the closest point of that parking lot. And you run your test from the closest point of that parking lot. So if it's greater than 50 feet away from the building, you still run the test, but you uh, run that to the closest parking to the building. And then this is our finished grade. We do the same thing, 50 foot. We measure to see what our angles are going to be. So what are those angles, all right? From where the planned entrance is, we drop down to the an existing grade. This is the first calculation, step A. Existing grade, from that entrance point down to that grade, we strike our arc, and we looked at the, or probably the closest in that arc, uh, from the site access point. We drop that point down to the existing grade, and then we measure the angle, the rise run angle between those two points. If it's greater than 10%, note it, and then we're going to run the finish grade, step B finish grade calculation. We do that at the finish grade. Same idea, from the entrance point down to the grade, from the site access point, in this case the vehicular arrival area, we drop it down to the grade, and if that is steeper than 10%, then this building does not have to, uh, it's deemed that this building then did not pass the site, at the, uh, site practicality test. So if it's a single building on a single site, no, no units are required to be compliant. But if it's a building with two entrances or more, or there's more than two buildings on it, or more than one building, or there's two or more buildings on the site, then we're still going to have to have 20% of the units on the site be compliant. If we have three buildings, maybe all of those units will be in one building. That's the easiest one to get the accessible route to. But 20% of the units on that site are going to have to be compliant. So again, I just want to reinforce that the site practicality test is not necessarily uh, a test to determine what buildings have to comply, but more often than not, it's about what percentage of units have to comply. So this is our 50-foot radius, so we're going to look at those entrance points in there. Here, since there's our, ex our accessible uh, access aisle, that's our site arrival point right there. That's where we would measure our 50 feet. All right? And we'd measure our angles between those points. Again, if we don't have anything within 50 feet, there's our 50-foot arc, we're going to go to the closest point. You don't have to go down here. You go to that point. Uh, breezeway building, again, one of these has to be compliant, one entrance. Side access point, point can serve one, two, three, four uh, ground floor units. One single one can do it. We don't have to have two. Two is fine. We have to get an accessible route from the site access point in to the building, and then from this building, we have to have an accessible route to the covered common use areas. All right, so we're going to use the individual building test on this. 
Here we have two ground floors, right? Because we have two vehicular access points. So we're going to run the individual building test for both of these. In this case, uh, do our 50-foot arc and our 50-foot arc. Our site and practicality test says that from our accessible parking, we are required to provide an accessible route to these, the units on this floor. But we go down here, we run this uh, site practicality test, individual building test. This is much steeper than 10%. So we're not required to provide an accessible route. And these ground floors down here are not covered. All right? Again, I know this is complicated. Use the design manual. Site analysis test. This is the most common test. We're going to run through this in a fair amount of detail. We look at three steps on this. The areas with slopes 10% or less. The buildable area is the second step we look at on this site. And the third step, step C, is from those buildings that were not captured under the site, the step A and B under the site analysis test, buildings that may not be required to provide units uh, because of the site analysis test, we'll look at those units in terms of step C and see if C requires an accessible route to get to those buildings, to the ground floor of those buildings. So buildable areas with a uh, slope of less than 10% is the white stuff here. The setback, we can't build in that setback. So we, we do not consider the uh, buildable area, the square footage of this setback area. We, do, we can't build in the easement, so we're not going to consider the square foot that, uh, footage that, that's in the easement. Even though we cannot build in this little pie-shaped thing because it's too small for a building, it is still buildable area, right? So because it's not an easement, it's not a setback, it's not wetlands, it's nothing like that, we can still, it's still part of our calculation. So we're going to, we're going to make a calculation. The area with a total buildable area with slopes less than 10%, we divide the buildable area with slopes less than 10% by the total buildable area, and then we're going to do step C. So we're going to run through this. Fair amount of detail. All right, we have three buildings on the site. Buildings one, two, and three. Now here, the dark area is the buildable areas with slopes less than 10%. It's the opposite on the other thing I've been talking about. But still, buildable areas with slopes less, less than 10% is the dark area. And the total buildable area is 90,000 square feet. Okay, So inside the setback of the easements, and we, ha we take out the area that is greater than 10%. So in that case, this is this area right in here. So this gray area is inside the easement and is in slopes less than 10%. That equals 90,000 square feet. All right. So we look at the slopes that are less than 10%, and we divide it by 90,000 square feet. And we end up with a 75% number. So 75% of our ground floor units, not all the units, but 75% of our ground floor units are required to be compliant. All right, there's our buildings. So let's take a look at the ground floor. How many ground floors do we have here? Well, this gray area, these, this ground floor, this gray area is ground floor because it comes out to this site arrival point. This lower area is ground floor because there's site arrival point down here. Same is true of this building. We have lower area, ground floor, middle level ground floor. The upper is not ground floor. All right. So in terms of ground floor units, how to calculate percentage of ground floor units, we're going to add all the ground floor units together. So six and four is what? Ten ground floor units in this building. Six and floor floor. Six and four units in this building is our ground floor units. So that's ten, and we have six units here that are ground floor units in this building. So we have ten, ten, and six. So we have a total of twenty-six ground floor units. So we take our seventy-five percent number, 
multiply by 26 and we end up with a requirement to have 20 ground floor units to be compliant on this site. All right? Yes? We'll get there. You're right. We'll get there. We are just counting the number of ground floor units at this point. Right? It is a ground floor because it's on the ground and it's a site arrival point, so it's a ground floor. So we're counting those units. We do the math. 75% times 26 equals 20 units. There's a question. The question was, if you have a split level uh, where you enter the building and you go down steps to get to the first level or you go up steps to get to the second level? Yeah, or on the exterior, whether it's inside the building or exterior. Um, which one is covered? Uh, good, good question. If, this, if there's a site arrival point on only one side, then you pick one. One of those is a ground floor unit, is ground floor level. So you either ramp up or you ramp down. Or you could use a lift, wheelchair lift, to get up or get down. All of the units on that particular floor are covered. Right. So here we have 20, our requirement for 20 units. Okay? So that's it. We went through that calculation. 20 units are required. I want to make sure. Oop. Sorry, folks. I'm not used to this particular machine. So we're going to take a look at 20 units. All right. Well, let's look at this building number three first. We're going to grab six of these units because they're at grade. Easy to do, right? We could put an elevator in this building and go to the second floor and get the six units at that second floor and end up with 12 in here. But we're going to say ground floor units, six at grade. Then we're going to come to the back side of this building, this side, and these are all at grade, and these are all at grade. So we're going to do six here, six here, and six here. What do we end up with? 18. How many are we required to have? So where are we going to get those 20? You want to build an elevator to one of the, in one of the, put an elevator in one of these buildings, go to the upper floor? You can do that. Question? Yes. Wouldn't an elevator uh, negate the site of It doesn't negate it. If you, if you put an elevator in a building, yeah, then all of the units in that building are required to be compliant. That's what I mean by it doesn't qualify. All the units in it. So if I put a build, an elevator in this building, all the units on that second floor have to comply. But you would still be able to apply the site of practicality to the remainder? But you would still be able to site, provide the site of practicality to the remainder. Yes. Okay. Yes, you would. Yes. Right? So we could provide an elevator in that building. Then every unit in that building has to comply. Two-story elevator, every unit has to comply. Or we could come down here and we could say, well, you know, elevator's nice, but a little expensive. Is there another way we can do this? Well, we could provide a ramp. If we get a ramp up to this level, this level has four units in it, how many units are now required to be compliant? 42? Oh, good. Yeah, I thought I said 42. Uh, 22, that's exactly right. 4 plus 18 is 22. How many are we required to have? 20. Can we go into this and only make two units accessible, not the other two? No, because once you get an accessible route to that, that level, all the units in that level are required to comply. All right? So we're going to end up with 22 units here. All right? That's great. Now, what about, what about this guy over here? We've got our 20, we've, we've met our number. 75% of the ground floor <coughs> units are covered. In fact, we're a little over 75%. Not unusual. What about this building over here? We're going to do now step C. This level, we don't have to look at because we got our numbers, right? Well, we still have to do step C on this building. 
And step C is where we have the slope of, from site arrival point to the building entrance measured at the finished grade. Okay? And remember I said this morning, on the individual building test, if it is greater than 10%, it's considered not, that it's steeper than what is required. But under step C, it's 8.33%. So if the slope from this sidewalk to this entrance point is greater than 8.33%, we're not required to provide a rent. And in this case, it is. This is steeper than 8.33% from this point to this point. Straight line measurement. So we're not required to provide a ramp. If it came in at 8.2%, we'd have to provide this ramp over here as well. Or anything less than 8.3%, then this level is now uh, required to comply as well. So we'd have to build a ramp. Or if you don't want to do two ramps, we could go back to the elevator. Your choice. Always options. The question was, is there any reason why you couldn't have this ramp leading to this point and put a, 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 a sidewalk over to this entrance? If this entrance was triggered, yes, you could do that. that a good solution? Yes, sir. Is step C required even though we're above 20 units? The question is, is step C required even though we're above 20 units? Yes. Step C is always required. As I said this morning, I've looked at a couple of site analysis tests and they've never done step C, right? And once, there was a significant problem. If they had done step C, they would have added a significant number of accessible units to, so it was not compliant. Another one, they hadn't done step C, but because of the way it worked, once we did step C, it didn't trigger anything else, right? But I've never seen step C done. It's missed all the time. For civil engineers that might be doing this, architects that might be doing this, and let me say this right now. The site analysis test, is required to be done by a licensed professional. Civil engineer, architect, I, there may be other licensed professionals, but those are the two that come to mind. Um, if I'm the building owner, I want my civil engineer to do this. And that is required to be filed. The owner needs to keep that site analysis test on file. That's not true of the individual building test, but it is true of the site analysis test. What we're talking about here, this test has to be conducted by a licensed professional. So just because you have steep terrain doesn't mean that you're not going to have accessible uh, or compliant, FHA compliant units. It is, it is always possible. We talked about unusual uh, characteristics. Again, you don't have to worry about tidal surge as much here. But you do have to worry about floodplains. Uh, is, this, is this Boise? Do you have nice sailing boats like this in the Boise River? What's that? Uh, again, if this is the Boise River, minding its own business, giant, this is your 100-year floodplain. From our site arrival point, that level, if we have to go more than 30 inches above that to get to the top of the finished floor of the first unit and the slope from the site arrival point to the top of that finished floor in the first unit is greater than 10 percent, you're not required. But if either one of those, if it's less than 30 or less than 10 percent, that triggers compliance for the ground floor unit of this building. All right. I need to, who's going to run my machine here? Who can get yeah, Eric, if you don't mind. We need to get to the next. I've got 225. Uh, do we want to take a break now, or do we want to go about another hour and take a break? I'm not hearing any panic. Break? break? <laughs> I just heard panic. All right. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll do the last two modules in one, uh, in one chunk. next one is going to be module 8, right? Yes, it's a 7, 8, yes. All look good? You got it. That's the one.
that terrific? All right. We're going to talk now in greater detail about accessible public and common use areas. A lot of this is going to be rehashing what we've already talked about. We're going to dive a little bit deeper in some of these areas. But this gives you a chance to ask questions from this morning that you may have or that may come up again. Please feel free, ask as many questions as you would like. So let's talk about this. Now, one of the areas that I think some people get very confused, but you guys are <laughs> very sharp audience. I don't think you're going to be con confused by this at all. But let me just point out that public and common use areas is sometimes misunderstood. People think that those areas within a development that are used by the people within that development are public areas. They are not. Those are common use areas. Common use areas are those areas that are open to and usable by residents and their guests, my definition. A public use area is where the public can actually go. Generally, in these developments, the public just can't, can't come off the street and go swimming in your swimming pool. Right? So generally, the swimming pool is a common use area and not a public use area. If one were to open up the swimming pool on Saturday morning to be nice to the neighborhood kids and say it's free swim on, from 9 to noon on Saturday morning, that pool now becomes a public swimming pool. It has to comply with the public ADA requirements. All right? But common use and public are different. Public has to comply with the ADA as well as the FHA, the ANSI requirements, high level of accessibility. The ADA standards and ANSI standards harmonize. They overlap pretty well. They pretty much uh, go hand in hand, but there are some slight difference. In the early, and as I said, in the early, yeah, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it. So what are we gonna do this afternoon? Well, overview the act, overview of the requirements one and two. We'll talk about key features of accessible routes and uh, public and common use areas. So we've done the history of the act. If anybody has any questions about this, please bring it up. And I apologize for this clicker. I'm getting the hang of it, I think, here. Enforced by uh, many different uh, organizations. I th one of the things I want to mention is that the level of enforcement at the federal level is picking up, and the level of private litigation is picking up. As people understand the Fair Housing Act better, I think we're getting more litigation, particularly on the private side. Right? So <coughs> there, there's more lawsuits out there. I heard a statistic, and I'm not going to, don't quote me on the actual numbers, but it's a very large percent of the complaints that HUD gets about the civil rights provisions of multifamily housing has to do with, with the Fair Housing Act. That didn't used to be the case. It used to be it was a very small percentage. It's a very big percentage now. And so HUD has taken notice, and they're answering those questions, but they're doing things like this, trying to increase the number of trainings so that everybody understands what the requirements are. Design and construction for first occupancy after March 13th, 91, it's covered. Anything that was designed and constructed and occupied before March 13th, 1991, is still covered by the reasonable accommodations provisions of the Fair Housing Act and the structural modification provisions of the Fair Housing Act, but not the design and construction requirements. Ground floor units, uh, always covered. Elevator triggers 100% compliance within the unit, within the building. Seven design and construction requirements. We're going to be talking now about public, uh, accessible public and common use areas. We have 10 safe harbors, and I think we're going to find that in requirement number one and two, so we're going to talk about number two here. And our standard for compliance is the ANSI standard, which is a high level of accessibility as opposed to the units, which is a lower level uh, of accessibility called adaptability, but applies to a very large number of uh, of the units.
key features of accessible routes. We just talked about this. So if there's any questions about this, I'm not going to go through this again. Any questions about slopes? Knock yourself out. Talk about ground surfaces. Stay away from, quote, natural surfaces uh, until the Department of Justice, until HUD adopts a standard for this. There really aren't anything out there other than pavers, wood, decking, concrete, and asphalt. Talk about protruding objects, particularly under these stair areas, curb ramps. All right, so let's talk about now the public and common use areas. I had talked about public parking. If we have public parking, it is serving the clubhouse, then that is technically parking that is serving the leasing area, let's say, I'm sorry, the, the, the leasing area. That parking and the areas that serve the leasing area are covered by the ADA as well as the Fair Housing Act. So the areas that serve the leasing areas, we just mentioned parking, the route to the, uh, the leasing office, the toilets that serve the leasing office, and anything else that serves the leasing office is required to be compliant. The swimming pool does not serve the leasing office, unless you've got an unusual way of leasing units. The swimming pool does not serve the leasing office. So the swimming pool will not have to comply with the ADA requirements. It still has to comply with the requirements of ANSI. Right? So here's our leasing office, here's our parking, here's our gazebo, our pool house. It is compliant, the pool is compliant, resident parking is compliant. We talked about garages and we talked about dumpsters. Car washers I haven't mentioned yet, we'll get into it here. If you provide a car care area on your, on your site, accessible route to that car care area, and then we'll talk about a little bit today about what uh, that, that area has to provide in terms of accessibility. Within the clubhouse itself, within the leasing area itself, sales office clearly required to be com uh, compliant with the ADA as well as the Fair Housing Act. Right? If any leasing operations occurs in the manager's office, then the manager's office has to comply with the ADA as well. But if the manager's office is just there to deal with residents, just those that have already signed leases uh, or own units, then the manager's office uh, has to comply only with the Fair Housing Act. If we have an area here, let's say this is a big storeroom or some sort of office that does not deal with the residents and does not deal with the leasing operation, then this area may not be required to be compliant at all. All right. But these are the bathrooms that are provided to serve the leasing office up here. Those bathrooms have to comply with both the ADA and the, the ANSI standard. Now, the good news there is that there's very little dif difference between ANSI and the ADA when it comes to, to uh, bathrooms. The kitchen itself, we'll talk about what's required in the kitchen. We'll talk about the club room itself, what's required there. What's covered? Well, this is an elevator building. And all the common areas within this elevator building are required to be compliant. Now, I want to point out some of the areas that are often over to the areas that are often overlooked. I mentioned this morning trash areas. If there is a uh, trash chute on each floor and there's a little room, well, the trash chute's covered, but if there's a little room between the common corridor and the trash area, that little space has to provide space, at least space, big enough for a wheelchair to turn around in, that clear floor space, compliant hardware, five pound maximum pull on the door. Uh, if that is a rated door, then it's a fire door and you might not have to do that five pound, but if it's not a rated door, the rating is just about the chute itself, the trash chute itself, uh, then the trash chute might not have a five pound maximum force, pull force on it, but uh, if the if the door into that room is a rated door, a fire rated door, then it may not have the fire. If it's not a rated door, then the maximum force to open that door is going to be five pounds. The area that is most often overlooked is if you have a roof deck that is open to uh, a common area, you know, and the people go up there and 
You know, maybe there is, you know, just chairs up there. Maybe just seating. Just a nice view. Well, if that's the case, you have to get an accessible route up to it. All right? I said earlier that if there is a recreation area, that maybe only a, a sufficient number of recreation areas are required to comply. So if we have two roof areas, maybe only one has to comply. But if there is a roof deck, you're going to have to get an accessible route to that roof deck. That generally means that your elevator surface is going to have to run to the roof. It's not running up to the top floor and then everybody takes stairs to get up to the roof. That's the easy way to do it. But if we got something on the roof that's a common area, you have to get an accessible route to that, to that roof. Multi-story walk-up buildings, again, we've talked about this in terms of uh, what's covered, what I haven't mentioned so far. If there's not an elevator in this building, it's only the ground floor units that are covered. But if it's, if this, this in this case is a two-story building, if for some reason we have, again, looks like it's on a nice beach area, right, down in Florida someplace? See some palm trees over there? You guys haven't got too many palm trees out here, right? So what, what, what if we have a nice overlook area up here? Again, if, it's there, there's, if there's anything going on on the roof that's common area, you've got to get an accessible route to it. If we have mailboxes on this level, those mailboxes that serve these common uh, units have to be accessible. If we have any common use areas on the second floor, let's say we have a laundry center on the second floor, all right, and there's only one washer dryer area in the building, and it's a common area and everybody has to use that. There's, a, there's even if there are washer dryers units in each, uh, uh, each one of the units, uh, if your common washer dryer room is on the second floor, it's got the big machines for doing the big bed spreads and that sort of thing, you're going to have to get an accessible route to it, or when you're designing it, get it down on the first floor. All right. So make sure that all your common use areas are on an accessible route. Yes, sir? In that example, if you provided an accessible route to the second floor because of laundry, would you then have to make all of the units on the second floor accessible? If you have an elevator that gets to that second floor, yes. So the question was, if you provide an accessible route to the second floor, do all of the units on that second floor, yes. If there's an accessible route to them, yes. Yes, sir? And Plus FHA. FHA. Right. Common areas, FHA only. Right. Is that your point? That's right. And so for the sake of those that are on the webinar, the question was there, there is a distinction between public and common. Yes. If it's a public space that the general public has access to, the general public has access to, it has to comply with the ADA as well as the FHA. But just because everybody in the development can use the pool doesn't make it public. That's a common space. It's a common area and it has to comply with the FHA requirements for common areas. But it doesn't make it a public space, unless it's opened up to the public. Then it would. Then it would. So if we've got multiple facilities, I mentioned this, if we've got two tennis courts, again, this is a recreation, and maybe only a sufficient number, maybe only one out of two has to comply. But I will tell you, to make a tennis court compliant, all we need is to get a route to it. There probably is a sidewalk that leads to it. As long as that sidewalk is compliant, why not make them both accessible? Now, if one is at the top of a hill, or let's say in our example here where we talked about the site and practicality exception or the uh, vehicular exception, if you put a tennis court that's way down low and another one in, in between those buildings, then clearly only one of those would have to comply. You still, do you remember the exception with the, the, the diagram I had where we had to put the road to get down to the tennis court? Well, if you had one out between the two buildings and one lower, you might not be required to have that accessible route down to the lower one. The one between the two buildings might suffice. Yes, ma'am. The question is, community gardens as a common area within a development. 
How do we deal with the surfaces? Do they have to be raised beds? Um, the route to that garden and the route throughout the garden is going to be is going to have to be compliant with the existing standards, all right? The existing ANSI standards, and I don't believe that's going to allow for a natural surface. Okay? Now. If you have three areas within that garden where you grow tomatoes, for some reason you've separated this, the tomatoes are in certain areas and you know herbs are in certain areas or flowers are in certain areas, um, then probably only one of those areas would have to be compliant. So you'd have to get an accessible route to that one tomato. There may be two other tomato areas. As long as that one tomato area serves the same purpose as the other two, it's on an accessible route. I would think that would probably be OK. Are you required to have raised planting beds? I would look to the uh, IBC. Under the guidelines we're talking about today, no. Uh, they don't cover gardens. But it's, I think it's always a good idea. I mean, it's not just people with disabilities that have a hard time bending and stooping to that. It's a lot of senior citizens that have a hard time. So it's a good idea to have raised planting beds, but is it actually required? Not by what we're talking about today, but there may be a requirement in the IBC or ANSI, in the later versions of ANSI that is. So make sure that your, what you're using as your safe harbor, um, you know what is required there. But again, I would go back as raised planting beds, at least to provide enough raised planting beds to serve the purpose that's being there. Herbs, vegetables, flowers. Uh, I think it's a good idea, but it may not be act actually be required. All right? A lot of what we're, uh, requirements are in the ANSI standards that we're not going to talk about. We're not going to get into details about every single one. So make sure, I mean, here we're talking about, they're, they're talking about stair nosings and treads and setbacks and all that sort of stuff. You're going to have to get into the ANSI standards to take a look at that. And here's our Fair Housing Act and ADAG uh, requirements. When we have Information Center, we have Leasing Center, we have any public accommodation, both the Fair Housing Act and ADAG. ADAG stands for the ADA Accessibility Guidelines. Now, ADAG is a common acronym for the 1991 ADA standards. All right? the, most people do not refer to the new standards, ADA standards, as ADAG. Most people refer to them as the 2010 ADA standards. And that's a good idea. Because the 1991 ADA standards, when it referred to ADAG, wasn't technically true. The Access Board produces the ADA Accessibility Guidelines, ADAG Guidelines. Right? Once the Department of Justice adopted those guidelines, they became standards. They became the 1991 standards. So the acronym ADAG actually wasn't valid for the 91, but people got used to it. Everybody knew what it meant. But there are new ADA standards out there. They became effective March 15, 2012. So if you're doing an ADA area, make sure you're using the new ADA standards. And you can download those off, off of ADA.gov. ADA.gov, DOJ website, nice, good website. It'll take you right to the 2010 standards, and you can download those standards. All the areas that uh, serve the leasing office required to be compliant. So the bathroom that serves the leasing office has to comply. Now, the bathroom that serves, that serves the clubhouse has to comply as well, but it only has to comply with the ANSI standards. But now we're talking about is both Fair Housing Act and the ADA. And that would be the leasing office. There may be other areas. There may be parking structures that you design and construct that serve retail, that could be part of your development. Well, the accessible, accessible parking that serves that retail, if it's in your building, if it's in your parking structure, it has to meet both the ADA and the Fair Housing Act requirements. You are required to meet the accessible route requirements for the ADA, as well as the FHA, to get to that uh, retail space. Right? So good news, there's not significant difference in the later version, later safe harbors. In the earlier safe harbors, there were. When it came to parking, the earlier, this is what people refer to as ADAC. 
right? It required parking to be level. No a slope no greater than 2% in any direction. So that parking space that served the leasing office had to be level. It also had to provide, an, at least one of those spaces had to be a van accessible space. A van accessible was an eight foot wide access aisle and an eight foot wide space. Fair Housing Act did not have level and did not have van parking in its requirements. All right. So ADA, back for the earlier safe harbors, had a different standard. That has ANSI and ADA have harmonized and that is no longer the case. And there's an example here. This is ADA and for a van accessible, eight foot wide space, eight foot wide parking space. Now you can get two van accessible spaces in here. Or this would count as two accessible <coughs> parking spaces even though it's a van accessible space you could park a van or a car here and you could use that space as well. This is under the uh, FHA and it's a 60 foot wide space. This entire area under the ADA can't slope more than 2% in any direction. Under the FHA, that was not a requirement. Signage is required at each, that's what these little black lines are. Under both the FHA and the ADA, signage is a requirement. The examples of the facilities that are uh, common areas, parking, clubhouse, public use kitchens, we'll get into some definitions on some of this. We've talked about parking. Uh, we've talked a lot about parking. Again, 2% of the spaces serving the covered units are required. And if you, uh, a minimum of one, if you provide accessible parking spaces at the mail kiosk, if you're provided at the pool, if you, if you provide parking at these areas, then at least one of those spaces has to be accessible. And what I've seen in a lot of situations, particularly for the mail, the mail kiosk is just in a wide spot of the road. You drive in, the mail kiosk is there, you pull over, you just jump out, you get your mail, you get back in and you, you go to your unit. Well, if that's the case, if that's what you got, then you're gonna have to provide one of those pull-off spaces that's gonna have to be accessible, right? It's gonna have to have an eight, a five foot wide space, accessible access aisle, and an eight foot wide parking space. So if you provide parking for any of those common areas, and you're gonna have to provide accessible parking. If you don't provide parking for your mail kiosk, if you don't provide any parking for your swimming pool, then you're not required to provide accessible parking. You're required to provide an accessible pedestrian route to get to those areas. And because as somebody mentioned this morning, many people with disabilities don't drive, can't drive, can't afford to have a car, that's why the accessible pedestrian route is so important. It's the first priority. Sufficient number of visitor parking, Again, we talked about sales and rental office, ADA and FHA. We talked about this requirement, that if you've got three different types of parking, your accessible parking is required to be distributed through those three different types of parking. So if we have a requirement for two spaces and we provide surface, carport, and enclosed garages, you're gonna have three accessible spaces because at least one of each one of those is gonna be required to be accessible. So what's an accessible enclosed garage? Well. Not unlike surface parking, we're required to have an eight foot wide space and a five foot wide access aisle, all right? Within that detached single car garage, okay? If we have a number of these side by side by side and each one of these is leasable, then, each one, then the accessible one, and again, and only 2% or a minimum one are required to be accessible, but you're required to not only have the eight foot wide space, the five foot access out, but an accessible route out of it. The HUD says, recommends, that a garage be 14 feet two inches wide. Why is that? Well, with a 10 foot door, all right? That allows for our 13 foot wide space and it allows for a one foot two inch return here because you really can't park tight into this space. You can pull straight in, but it's difficult to, once you're in here to maneuver. Most garages don't have this kind of space in them, right? They're a little bit tighter front to back than this. So recommendation is four, the minimum dimension of the width of this is 14 feet, two inches, and we have an with a 10 foot door. Now, that's to allow the car to pull up and to get space behind the car to get out the door. If we have an accessible route through the side of the garage, 
then this door is not going to be part of our accessible route. The overhead door is not going to be part of an accessible route, and there's no regulation for that. There's no requirement for that. But if this, if this overhead door is part of the accessible route, then HUD recommends that it be at least 10 feet wide. And we talked about this typical accessible, eight foot space, five foot access aisle. Okay. Typical clubhouse. Once we get in the clubhouse, an accessible route to get in the clubhouse, an accessible route to and throughout the entire area, all right? To get us around the pool table, to get us to the closet, to get us to the, the vending machine, to get to the seating area where the fireplace is, to get us out to the pool and around the pool, all right? Currently, under the uh, FHA requirements, unlike the ADA, there is no requirement to get in and out of the pool. The ADA, there is a requirement now, under the new 2010 standards, to get in and out of pools. If it's a small pool, less than 300 feet perimeter, a lift or a ramp is required. If it's a big pool, more than 300 feet, a lift or a ramp is required, plus a secondary means. Could be transfer boards, could be could be lifts or ramps, a secondary means, but it needs to be at least two. So once, once we're in that clubhouse, that accessible route has to get us to all those common areas that's in there. So let's talk about the kitchen. All right, when the accessible route into the kitchen, we have to be able to turn around within that kitchen. So here is that T-turn I talked about before where you pull in, you pull in here, you back out, and you turn this way, okay? That's a T-turn. That space right here has to be at least 36 inches wide. We have to have knee space below the sink. That knee space below the sink only has to be 30 inches wide. So if that, you think that that knee space below the sink can serve as your part of your T-turn, it can, but that space has to be 36 inches wide if that's gonna be the case. And it's not unusual to see that these uh, T-turns do not provide the 36 inches. The, the, the sink has to be no higher, the top of the rim of the sink, no higher than 34 inches above the floor. A six and a half inch deep, deep sink so that there's knee space below. 27 inches knee space below because in a common area, again, a higher level of accessibility, forward access is required. That is not necessarily the case within the units, but it is within the ANSI uh, common use spaces. Some people have commented when I talked about side access to the refrigerator. Refrigerator can't be in the corner. Well, it can be, but we're gonna have four feet because we have to have forward access here. If we don't have forward access, four inches from, four feet from this counter to the face of that refrigerator, if we don't have at least four feet, then we're gonna have to have side access. And if we have side access to a 30 inch wide refrigerator, that refrigerator has to be off this sidewall by at least nine inches. So it can't go into the corner, all right? And then this is a dining area, so we're gonna have a lowered dining area here with forward access. Again, you can see how this projects out. Forward access there, if there's a dining area. If there's not a dining area, then we're gonna have, or a bar area, then we're gonna have the sink and an area next to the sink at least 30 inches wide that provides a work surface that's at 34 inches, all right? Other than that, Counters can be at 36 inches. This counter can be as high as 42 inches. You can have stools here that people sit there. But if you've got that, you're gonna have to have that lowered area well, as well so that somebody using wheelchair can sit at that, quote, raised area. This is the ANSI standard for a sink. Again, six and a half deep, inches deep. We're gonna have to protect the pipes down here. They can be protected with a barrier like this, or it can be insulation. We're all familiar with the insulation you can buy. They can snap around these pipes, as well as the hot water and cold water supply to them. You've got to have 27 inches of knee space to the bottom of the apron, as well as the sink. All right, toe space down here has to be at least nine inches high and six inches deep. We got plenty here. Faucet has to have a, a Operable control, accessible control, single level, lever. Cooktops and ranges, again, we have to provide here centered space on those cooktops and ranges. These have to be the controls 
have to be within an accessible reach range, and these aren't. So I'm going to tell you, with the common use area, you're going to have to get controls at the front or down the side. All right? They can be elect. Sometimes they're mounted on top at the front, where you've got your controls. All that's fine. But we're not talking about unit design now. We're talking about a high level of accessibility. So the controls have to be within reach range and have to be accessible as well. How about upper cabinets? And see, the, the, the guidelines don't talk about upper cabinets. The newer standards will talk about it, where at least 50% of the storage space has to be compliant. Right? But the most recent ANSI standards, I think, may not have the requirement. I think 98, 2003 is going to have a requirement for at least 50%. But I think the standards that occur of that, and don't quote me, say that you only have to provide uh, uh, the wheelchair footprint at the cabin, and they don't regulate the height of the cabin. But it's up to the safe harbor you're using. Make sure you double check the safe harbor you're using, because they do change. <coughs> Talked about fitness rooms. Again, the equipment itself is not required to be compliant, but you're required to get it into the room. And any common areas within that room, drinking fountain, bathroom, towels, that sort of thing, have to be on an accessible route. The door in the inside has to be accessible. So you need clear maneuvering space for that door. The door can't take more than five pounds to operate. And here's again, the reach range. They are calling for 54 inches here for a side reach. I'm telling you, your newer ANSI standards are not going to allow 54 inches. It's going to be down to 48 for forward or side approach. This is an area we see violations in a lot, where you've got these pull-out trays in a business center, pull-out trays below. At least one of them is going to have to provide 27 inches in knee space. All right, 27 from the floor to the bottom of that tray, 27 inches, and it has to be at least 19 inches deep. All right, it's not a difficult standard to meet. You just got to be aware of it. And again, we talked about all the common areas. And Toilets have to be accessible. This is the clear floor space required in a under ANSI that is required around the water closet. Standard stalls. If it's wall mounted or floor mounted, it's a different depth. Right? This is accessed into from the side into the uh, this is the stall that goes all the way across the, uh, the, the bathroom. This is where you enter from this. One of the areas that we see most often violated is this little area right here. Right? This little area right here uh, can't be any more than four inches from that side partition. Why is that? Because this door has to be perpendicular to the corner of where the water closet is located, or you can't maneuver inside here. Right? This door has to be on the opposite corner of the water closet. And so that can't be more than four inches right there. Okay. And then, again, once we get in here, this has to be at least 30. This is the room, the stall that goes all the way across the, uh, the bathroom, 36 plus these two dimensions. If you have a wall-mounted water closet, this depth has to be 56, 56. If it's floor-mounted, it's a little bit higher, um, and uh, 59 inches in depth, 59 inches here. ANSI alternate stall, the earlier ANSI's allow for an alternate stall. The ADA does not allow for an, ANSI, an alternate stall anymore. But an alternate stall was designed to be at least 48 inches wide with a depth now instead of 56 or 59, 66 or 59 in terms of additional depth. So it's an uh, additional 10 inches deep for the alternate stall. But you could go down to have a 36 inch wide stall or a 48 inch minimum. Why the, 30, the 36 is for transferring like this. You can't transfer in a 30, you know, a narrow stall if it's 48 inches wide. Let's say it's 47 inches wide. It's too wide. You can't do that. You know, you got to get above it. So 36 inches or 48 inch width, 48 inch minimum width. But remember, the depth is deeper, 10 inches deeper for an alternate stall. Again, if this is the bathroom that is serving the ADA space, the public accommodation, under the new 2010 standards, alternate stalls are not allowed. 
Talked about accessible laboratory. Here's my toe space, at least six inches deep, nine inches high. Uh, knee space, at least 27 inches, 27 back. I'm sorry, eight inches back from the front of that. Uh, the bottom of the reflecting surface of the mirror is it? <coughs> no higher than 40 inches. It's the reflecting surface. If you've got a fancy frame around it, it's not the bottom of the frame, it's the bottom of the reflecting surface, the functional part of that mirror. Large toilet rooms. Uh, we talked about the stalls. We talked about knee space underneath laboratories. The area that is most often violated is the clear floor space at these doors. All right? So we ne need to know whether your door swings in to the space or swings out, whether you're approaching it from the hinge side or you're approaching, in this case, from the latch side. You've got to get in there and find out what the different clear uh, uh, maneuvering space requirements are for these doors. Get into those ANSI standards and take a look. If you have a small toilet and a dressing room, at least one, in this case there's a shower, at least one of those showers has to be compliant. And the area that's most overlooked at shower accessibility is we need a 30 by 48 inch footprint to allow a transfer into this 3 by 3 shower. That means that we need the front of that 48 inch footprint has to go to the wet wall to where the controls are. So we're going to need at least 40, I'm sorry, 12 inches beyond that shower. If this is 3 feet wide, that footprint is 4 feet long. We need 12 inches here. That allows for an easy transfer across because your butt is about in the same position as the bench. And you can just slide across. And it's pretty easy. But at least one laboratory, one shower, one dressing bench, one stall within a dressing area has to be compliant. Sauna, you got to be able to get in. Five foot turning areas, in, in this case, a five foot turning diameter within the stall. And again, a space for a parallel or a, a perpendicular transfer in this, uh, onto the bench. All right, you guys have been sitting here for a long time. You haven't had anything to do. Turn to your neighbor if you got one. Take a look at this and try to come up with a list of violations you see. I'm going to give you about five minutes. But come up with a list of violations you see here that you think that are obvious that are jumping out at you. I said there was going to be a test. This is your test. If you don't get these right, we don't go home until everybody here gets this right.
Two minutes to go. All right, put your pencils down. Um, I promised somebody I would make a couple of announcements right after lunch, which I failed to do. So before we get into this exercise, let me make these announcements. Um, when you turn in, you're going to receive an evaluation form. Have you received an evaluation form? Everybody's got it. Okay, good. When you turn that in, you will then receive your certification for those that need certifications. So you got to turn it in, all right? That's the idea. You got to turn it in. Um, if anybody hasn't, if anybody was, wasn't here this morning and didn't sign in, you can do that now. All right? You can take advantage of that. And then there are a couple of, of the, the manuals that are left over. So if anybody needs a couple more manuals, if you got folks back in the office or folks back at your independent living center that you think this would be uh, good for them, feel, to, feel free to grab those. All right, so I am done with my announcements. And now what I want to do is I'm going to look at a certain area, and I'm going to ask you guys to tell me what is, uh, what is not, give me one example of something that's not compliant here. So my first area, of course, I'm picking on you guys right in here. Can any one of you throw up a hand and give me something that's non-compliant? You get to go first, so you, you know, not going at the end. Curb ramp. What's wrong with the curb ramp? There's no walk around it. Is there a walk? Is it required? Why? Right. We're assuming. Somebody said we're assuming. And that's a good assumption. All right. That's a good assumption. If there was no, nothing down here, there was just more parking and this sidewalk stopped here, and all of the residential buildings were at this end of the sidewalk, right? then we, we could use this sidewalk to get to this. But what does that mean? It means we have a cross slope problem right here. So that curb ramp would be that would be a problem there. So I, I'm going to agree with you. Yeah, there needs to be a route. But we don't know exactly by looking at this plan where that, where that accessible route would have to be. But we're going to assume this is connecting to buildings covered buildings, and so we're going to have to get a route from those covered buildings into this clubhouse. All right, very good. You guys in the back back here, you know, throw up your hands. Anybody got a... No? All right, right down here, in this front corner down in here, you guys. The gate into the pool deck? The gate into the pool deck. What about it? Exactly. And that we see, we see a violation right there. And how deep does that have to be? Oh, man, you get to go home right now. Right? You can take a bottle of water. Well, we're out of water. Yes, 60 inches deep. So if I came out here, 18 inches, poured a piece of concrete that was 60 inches deep, that would make that compliant. So I don't need to have a five-foot-wide sidewalk to get there. All right? Very good. Yes, sir.
That's a good question. But I want to make sure there's no confusion about the way you asked the question. You asked it that the clubhouse has to meet the ADA and the pool has to meet FHA. The clubhouse does not necessarily have to meet, the entire club does, the clubhouse does not necessarily have to meet the ADA. We do have a leasing office here. It's required to comply with the ADA and those areas that serve the leasing office. So the manager's office may or may not, depending on how the manager functions. If the manager sees potential, you know, new tenants, then in, in that office, then yes, it would have to comply with the ADA. But the kitchen is probably does not serve the leasing office. So the kitchen does not have to comply with the ADA. But it does have to comply with the FHA. All right? So given that, what are you saying has to comply in here with what standard? Correct. Having said that, it's, I want to make sure that the web, folks on the web get this. It's a mix. Right. That's right. The baseline is everything has to comply with the FHA, and there are some areas that have to go beyond the FHA and comply with the ADA. Regarding the manager, um, would that not be um, a potential point of, of uh, employee um, problems if you Absolutely not. Are you accusing me of discrimination? <laughs> Ask, where's my lawyer? Where's my lawyer? <laughs> Title I of the ADA, since this is an employment situation, there is some question as to whether the ADA applies here because the ADA does not cover housing. Generally, most types of housing, it does cover some. Um, but let's assume for a moment the ADA did cover this. Title I of the ADA says you have to make a reasonable accommodation. So that management office is not required to comply other than approach, enter, and exit that door. Nothing in that management office required to comply. But if they were to hire me and I needed to have space in here for a desk and a couple chairs and space to turn around in there, yeah, they would have to make a reasonable accommodation under Title I of the ADA for me. That's a one-on-one -on -one case. It's not just this being about me. So you can design employee areas under the ADA that are not compliant, but if you hire somebody with a disability, you have to make a reasonable accommodation, and you can't refuse to hire somebody who has a disability because, well, that means I'm going to have to make a reasonable accommodation. Right? You can't do that. Having so, good said question. all that, we found four uh, errors or problems with all right. that building. Having said all of that, I want to make sure the website get this. He's found four errors. Errors. Give me one now, because I want to keep going around the move, room. Give me one. Exactly. That the, the, the statement was, we think that the main entrance is not accessible and this is, acts more like a service entrance because bathrooms are there and all that stuff. Exactly correct. That is exactly right. All right. Let's go over down in this area. Yeah, question over here? I, I would say that's a violation. The question was, is that a violation or a preference? I would say it's a violation. The main entrance this is the main entrance. This is clearly a secondary entrance. And I, I would say that's a violation. Yes? It's going back to the piece of the wall, I mean, piece of the light back, where you have glass in the back window. It's the same, it's exactly right. This is the same sort of thing. That's also pre-Civil War. <laughs> Just to keep the record straight. OK, over this area, guys, you got something? Uh, the bathrooms, yeah, the restrooms, what about them? Seem pretty small, don't they? That is exactly right. You can't get in there and turn around. That's exactly right. Okay, back in this corner, yeah, no grab bars, that's right. Back in this corner over in here. I'll put the green light on you. Yes, sir. Steps to the spa, that is correct. That is correct. Then way, way in the back. What's that? 
opening the closet doors. Uh, what closet doors? Oh, this, I'm sorry, right out here. Uh, inside here, here? No. Those would be okay. Well, as long as, as, as those are reach-in closets, and as long as it's, th these are not um, uh, passage doors. So those are reach-ins. Yes, sir? Exactly right. We don't have, this is a, a, a high level of accessibility, and we don't have a turnaround within the kitchen. That's exactly right. Anything else? Yes, sir. Excellent, excellent question. The question was, if this was a clubhouse on a development that had no covered dwelling units, does it have to comply with the FHA? And the answer is no, it doesn't. The leasing office still has to comply with the ADA because it's a leasing office. But if you have some, if you have one covered dwelling unit on this site, then it triggers accessibility in the, all the common. The, the, could be a duplex, right? That's right. Okay. That's right. Any others? In the, there's no access to the pool. The pool is not required to have. There's a, all you're required to do in the pool is get to the edge and around the pool. You're not required to get in the pool. The ADA has a requirement to get in the pool, but this pool isn't covered by the ADA. There's another question back, another, yes, sir. Our, we're, we're assuming there is 18 inches here. The first comment was there wasn't 18 inches there, and you're right. But on the push side, if, um, if this door, this gate has both a closer and a latch, right, on the push side, it's required to have 12 inches, and we got it there. We get into arguments about what is a closer on a gate. And so I called the Building Manufacturers and Hardware Association. You guys familiar with that? And I asked them, I said, what is a closer on a gate? And I got this extremely technical answer was, anything that closes the gate. <laughs> OK, that's a closer. I, uh, it's hard to argue with that answer. It's hard to answer, uh, argue with that answer. So if you got a spring hinge, that's a closer. <coughs> Triggers requirements for the clear movement space. All right, very good. You guys got everything. Yeah, one, one more. What if the spa was at a high speed through the site transfer? What if the, the, the spa? Yeah, so an individual could roll up to it and then yep. for a five Yep, I, I agree with you. But how deep does this have to be before that is allowed? So what he's saying is if I can pull up to the spa and have a side transfer and just get on this and then slip into the spa, that's allowed under the accessibility, the 2010 accessibility standards, and I think it should be allowed here. But the depth of that top is going to be a, a consideration. What if the depth of that top was 50 feet? All right? Then no. Well, it's a lot of bumping over in your butt to get to the water, right? So I would say no. This, if you just transfer onto that deck and you turn around, Pull your legs over and now you drop into the spa. I think that's okay. But that's my opinion. I think that's okay. Because the new 2010 ADA standards allow it. I think the two, new 2010 ADA standards provide one, define access in, in and out of a pool. And the Fair Housing Act doesn't. So if you're following something, a national standard that defines access in and out of the spa, in and out of the pool, I think you're okay. But that's just me. All right, we got to keep going here. And we have to get through bathrooms. So let's keep going. There you go. You guys got all of that. Very good. We've talked about all of these additional areas that have to be complied. We've talked about mailboxes. What I didn't mention when I talked about mailboxes, that the, the mailboxes themselves have to be compliant. 
It also has to be on an accessible route. That makes sense. If you have to turn around within a kiosk, you have to have that 60 degree turning, 60 inch turning. And uh, any of the common areas within a mail room. All right? So this mail drop slot now has to be no higher than 48 inches. Under the older X, uh, uh, FHA standards, that could be 54. But under the new ADA standards, at least one of each type has to be, uh, the mail drop has to be uh, within 48 inches. And parcel pickup. If I've got three parcel pickup boxes, when the, the mail person, the mail carrier comes up and says, oh, it's going to Jack Hallen, it's a big box, I stick it in here, they can't be expected to know that I use a wheelchair. Right? So all of the parcel pickup boxes have to be on an accessible route and at the key has to be at an accessible height. Yes, sir? No, all mailboxes that serve covered dwelling units. So if this is a three-story walk-up development, right, and some of these mailboxes don't have to be at an accessible height because the second and third floor of a walk-up unit not required to be covered. If this is the mail, mail area that serves a, uh, 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 an elevator serve building, then yeah, the highest one here can't be any higher than 48 under the new, 54 under the old. There we go. See there? HUD says you can go down as low for a side approach as 9 inches. Postal Service not going to allow that. All right. So bear in mind. Accessible laundry rooms, 36-inch um, route. You can have the top-loading machine as long as you got the grabbers. You, you're going to have a uh, folding table. Top of that folding table can't be any higher than 34 inches off the floor. Knee space below it is preferred. If you have outlets behind that folding area for ironing, those outlets have to be at that 46-inch maximum, 46-inch height we talked about earlier. Car care. At least one of these bays, if in this case, this bay, if it's served by, this is our washing and this is our vacuum, and that vacuum can serve either bay, but uh, this washing, if this is the washing thing, only that bay would have to be, could be accessible. That means we need a 36 inch route around the entire car that doesn't have a cross slope of more than 2%. All right? Now, if I can get all of, all of it done in one bay, then only that bay has to be compliant. But if I can only wash in one bay and have to go to another bay to dry, then both bays are going to have to comply with this. So bear that in mind. Gazebo, accessible route into the gazebo. Accessible route to play areas. A question came up earlier. What, what are we required to do? Well, you're required to get an accessible route to the play surface. All right? If that play surface, this wood chipped area, the under the current Fair Housing Act, under the standards we're looking at, required to get an accessible route, so we would have an accessible route that takes us to the wood chips. All right. Let me go with my right hand. If these wood chips were down, let's say we had a curb running around this whole thing and these things were down six inches, then that accessible route has to get down to the wood chips. So we might be building, starting a ramp out here that slopes down gently to get to those whip chips. If you don't want handrails on those ramps, that slope of that ramp has to be what? Less than 5%, right? Under the ADA now, and we're going to say this play area does not, have to, does not have to comply with the ADA, but under the ADA, a certain percentage of these play components has to be accessible, and the surface has to be accessible for a certain percentage of these not the entire play area, but a certain percentage of this play area is going to have to be compliant under the ADA. So if you're being a good Samaritan and you not only open up your pool to the kids on the weekend, you open up your playground to the kids on the weekend, this becomes a public playground, then it's going to have to comply with the new 2010 ADA standards for new design and construction. So bear that in mind. Even if it was an old existing one, it's, it's going to be required to comply. But under the Fair Housing Act, that all it has to do is comply with, the, comply with the Fair Housing Act, we have to get an accessible route to the, to the playground surface. Surfaces and covered. We talked about trash facilities. 
Here's an example where they build up so that they can get to this door, but technically um, not required. Here's our headroom. Again, wall sconces that are below 80 inches could be a problem if they're more than four inches off the wall. Planters, if they're more than four inches, you know, if they're hanging below 80 inches, could be a problem. Bear that in mind. Drinking fountains, again, forward approach. Public telephones. Anybody putting public telephones in developments anymore? <laughs> I don't think so. Talked about accessible doors. Talked about this pinch point that the accessible route can go down to less than 36 at doors and passages, and we're into common areas now. So anytime you've got a pinch point that's less than uh, 36, that's OK. But it can't be less than 32 inches in width. And the running direction dimension can't be uh, greater than 24. So for a very, very short point, it can go down to 32 inches, the accessible route. Talked about the clear floor space at the doors. Here's our exterior gates to, uh, here's our, see how I got a little, we've got our 18 inches on the pull side here. All right. Accessible hardware at the doors. And our ANSI specifications. Again, accessible route out to the pool, around the pool. And then here's our resources. Again, there's our hotlines. And is Eric here somewhere? If you can flip me into the next, if somebody, yeah, there you are, Eric. Somebody get me next to, we're going to talk about bathrooms within units. Yes, sir. The gate, the question is, the gate that's entering the pool has to have door hardware. I don't know what you mean by door hardware, but it has to have accessible hardware. All right? It has to be accessible. So if you've got something that, a knob that requires twisting, it's going to have to be a lever that does the twisting. And our last subject is strategies for compliant bathrooms. I'm going to jump through the front end of this because we've done the front end before. So we're talking about usable bathrooms. We're not necessarily talking about accessible bathrooms, but usable. We are, out, we are now in the unit. We're not talking about common areas. Common areas have accessible bathrooms, high level of accessibility. Once we get in the unit, it's not technically accessible. It's adaptable because it doesn't meet all the requirements for an accessible bathroom. But we're familiar with our 30 by 48 inch footprint. You'll see that used a lot. Clear floor space at the fixtures. We're going to get into these general requirements. If we've got a toilet, a sink, tub, and or shower, we have a bathroom. I am not talking about powder rooms right now. I'm talking about bathrooms, all right? Bathrooms. Powder rooms within a unit are only required to be compliant when they are the only bathroom fixture on the first floor of a multi-level unit that is served by an elevator. Got all that? So you got a high rise at the top, high rise, the penthouse is instead of flats, the penthouse is a multi-level unit, two stories. All right? I said earlier multi-level units aren't covered. Well, they are covered if there is an elevator that gets you to that multi-level unit. It is covered, but only the first floor, the primary entrance level, is covered. And that entrance is required to have either a compliant bathroom or powder room. All right? So that powder room then would be required to be fully compliant, which means it's kind of required to have all the clear maneuvering space, clear floor space that we have for bathroom that, we, we're, that we're going to talk about now. But basically what I'm talking about now is bathrooms. Two requirements, clear floor space within the bathroom outside of the swing of the door, and clear floor space at the bathroom fixtures. So here it is all put together in one diagram. This is the door. This is the clear floor space beyond the swing of the door. The idea here is that, unlike a kitchen, 
in a bathroom, you function in the bathroom with the door closed. So you got to be able to get that 30 by 48 foot footprint into the bathroom and close the door behind you. You're not necessarily required to turn around in the bathroom, right? But you're required to be have this 30 by 48 inch clear foot floor footprint beyond the swing of the door. Once the door closes, then you back up and you've got your 30 by 48 centered on a sink. You've got the other clear floor space requirements, and we'll talk about these. Now, there are two bathroom requirements or allowances, spec A and spec B. Spec A is usually considered a lower level of accessibility, a minimum level of accessibility or usability. In a spec A, all fixtures are required to comply. So if I have a vanity with two bowls, both bowls have to comply. Um, spec B, and we'll talk about what differentiates spec A and spec B, uh, is considered a little bit more accessible, but only one of each fixture is required to comply. I know that's not really intuitive, but spec B is considered more accessible, but only one of each fixture, so if I have two laboratories, two bowls, only one of those bowls has to comply. Now write this in. In a spec B bathroom, according to the guidelines, according to the guidelines that we're using for this training, the top rim of the accessible bowl can't be any higher than 34 inches off the floor under a B. Under an A, it's not regulated. You can have a 36 inch high rim, you can have a 36 inch high counter with a bowl on top of the counter that sticks up another inch or two. Under A, it's not regulated, but under a B, it is. The height of the accessible bowl can't be high. The top of that rim can't be more than 34 inches above the floor. All right, so let's, two. This is an A. A spec A allows a perpendicular approach to the bathing fixture. So here's my, beyond the swing of the door, that's fine. This is also my approach to the bathing fixture. It can be perpendicular. It can also be parallel, but it can be perpendicular. All right? In a B, it can only be a parallel approach to the bathing fixture. The toes of the 30 by 48 space have to reach the control wall. All right? That allows for a parallel transfer into the bathing fixture, in this case, a bathtub, all right? That's the B. So if we have a parallel approach to a tub and we have a, at least one bowl lavatory that is not higher than 34 inches, we've got ourselves a B, all right? Why is that a big deal? Well, what are you required to do? If I have one bathroom in my unit, is it required to be an A or a B? Either one, up to you. You can provide an A or you can provide a B. It doesn't matter, right? But if I have two bathrooms, are they required to be A's or B's or combination? Again, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, but, and this is the big button, if you do, if you choose to make one an A, then all the bathrooms have to comply at least with A. Second one could be a B, but the second one has to be an A, at least meet the requirements for an A. If you choose to make one of them a B, like this one, this is a B, right? Then the other bathroom does not have to provide, uh, comply with requirement number seven, clear floor space at the fixtures, all right? And the clear floor space at the fixtures is what drives, and the, and the, and the uh, clear floor space beyond the swing of the door, that's what drives the size of the bathroom. And these bathrooms per, per square foot can be the most expensive places within the unit. So if you go with an A, then all, the, then all the bathrooms have to be A. 
If you go with a B, which is presumed to be a little more accessibility, provide a little more accessibility, you are rewarded with that only the, uh, the other unit doesn't have to comply with the requirement number seven. Why do I say that? It still has to provide an accessible, usable door. It still has to provide uh, environmental controls at accessible heights, right? But it doesn't have to provide the second one. The first one's a B, the second bathroom doesn't have to provide the requirement number seven, which is the clear floor space beyond the swing of the door and clear floor space at the fixtures. I know this is complicated to get a hold of, but the design manual does a good job of explaining this. So, which one? If I'm going to go with a B, and the other, the other one only complies with, uh, uh, doesn't have to comply with requirement number seven, which one is going to be the B bathroom? Is it going to be the hall bathroom, or is it going to be the master bedroom bathroom? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, all right? It just one of these, if one of these is a B, like this, this is the hall, this is a B, this could also serve as a master, You've got direct connection. It doesn't matter, it's your choice. What's important here is that if it's an A, all the fixtures have to comply, and you are allowed to have a perpendicular approach to the bathing fixture. If it's a B, you have to have a parallel approach to the bathing fixture. That 30 by 48 inch parallel approach has to, toes have to get to the wet wall. And uh, this, this, the lavatory, at least one lavatory can't be any higher than 34 inches. Okay? So let's, let's assume that we've got clear floor space. This is clear floor space beyond the swing of the door. That's my 30 by 48 inches. Can I design this so the door swings out? That all the doors swing out? Yep, you can design it so all the doors swing out, and then your 30 by 48 can uh, uh, be here, right? You can, it's gonna be a little bit smaller if you design it to, for the door to swing out, okay? But most people design for the door to swing in because it's a lot easier to close the door. All right, once I'm in, I've closed the door, now let's talk about the lavatory. Under both spec A and spec B, I'm required to have a 30 by 48 inch clear floor space centered on the lavatory. Centered on the bowl, the lavatory itself. Not centered on the vanity. I can have 36 inch vanity, a 35 inch vanity, a 34 inch vanity. That doesn't matter. What matters is that my 30 by 48 inch is centered on the bowl. So I need 24 inches from that wall to the center line of that bowl, 24 inches at least. That allows me to have a 30 by 48 inch clear floor space position centered on that bowl. I can go 48 inches, but I can go less, a little bit less. Be careful if you go less because that 30 by 48, you'll notice you can get an inch or two under that water closet, but not much more than an inch or two. So make sure you provide clear floor space uh, that allows you to get parallel and the water closet's not in the way. There's a question in the back. Yeah, where would, in a uh, A bathroom, where would you be placing graphite in the bar? In both an A and a B, the question is, in an A bathroom, where would you place the grab bars? Especially with, uh, well, I guess for both. Uh, yep, it doesn't matter because my answer is, one, you never have to place grab bars. You're not required to provide grab bars. You are required to provide blocking. And that doesn't matter. Uh, that blocking is not part of requirement number seven. All right, that's requirement number six. That blocking has to be in both, in all the bathrooms. All right, and we've talked about that earlier. We'll talk about again where that blocking has to go. All right, so when I get the diagrams up, we'll talk about where the blocking has to go. But it, it doesn't matter whether it's A or B because it's both. All right, so this is what I'm talking about. If we make this too small, then my clear floor space uh, is going to, for my wheelchair, is going to be too far under the toilet. If I have 15 inches here, I'm allowed to have 15, this sink centered on 15 inches, but it has to be a forward approach, all right? Because 15 inches is centered on a 30 inch wide clear floor space. 
and I can have a removable base cabin under here that's readily removable. My definition of readily removable means that it's easy to remove without special tools, that myself and the maintenance guy at the, uh, in the development can do it. I don't have to hire a contractor to do it. All right? It's pretty simple and straightforward to do. A couple of screws, I pull out that base cabinet, my floor finishes go all the way through, the wall is finished underneath there. When I pull it out, it looks as good with the, with the cabinet removed as it does with the cabinet in. There was a question over here. The requirements for plumbing fixtures at the sink, we earlier talked about a single lever faucet, and here uh, it's not shown that way. Is there a distinction between a kitchen and a bathroom sink? Okay. The question is, for those on the web, is about the faucet and good eyes. This, even, even though it's lever, even though those, these are lever, the faucet design within the unit is not regulated. The kitchen we were talking about before was in a common area. Higher level of accessibility, the faucet is regulated. Within the unit, it's not regulated. The faucet doesn't matter. It does in a common area, it does not within the unit. All right? So be careful about this space. Make sure if you, you can have 15 inches here, but you're going to have to have forward space. You're going to have to have enough room for a forward space, and you're going to have to finish, and you're going to have a removable base cabinet. You're going to have to finish that floors underneath the removable base, or at the removable base cabinet. Yes, sir? The clear floor space has to be, provide 30 cents opening. So if I have, it's, it's not unusual to buy a vanity top that's 30 inches wide that has support underneath it that would prevent the 30 inch clear floor space underneath it. So if I go, if I go to Home Depot and I buy a vanity top that's 30 inches wide, I'm going to have some vertical capability for that vanity that's going to, that's going to support it vertically, right? And that usually occurs within the 30 inches. So, if so I wouldn't have 30 inches of clear floor space if I bought a 30 inch vanity, usually. It's conceivable if you hang it on the wall it is conceivable, but you need 30 inches of clear floor space below. Right. If you have a wall-hung sink that is 16 inches wide, that's okay. But it's going to have to be positioned in a way that I can either get a, a parallel approach to the side centered on it or forward approach that's centered on it. Okay? But yeah, it's a wall-hung will work. I would caution you, well, yeah, it would work. I don't have to worry about that here. So here's our forward approach, all right? 15 inches is fine, but you notice that 30 inches goes all the way to the edge. How is this being supported? Yeah, I don't know. Sky hooks? Well, but those arms can't be inside this 30 inches because I have to have that clear floor space, 30 inches wide, has to be clear up to 27 inches. Right, but it could be above the 27 inches. If you can sneak it in above the 27 inches, that's correct. You can do that. That's right. That's right. All right, now here's the, we've talked about this. This is a forward approach for both A and B, spec A and B, you can have forward approach. And here's just an example of removable base cabin. You'll notice the floor finish goes all the way. It's finished all the way under. This side is finished. That side is finished. And here's our clear floor space at the water closets. Now, this is going to take some splaining. So I'm going, to start, I'm going to start with the simple one, which is number two. This is not uncommon. You're entering from the side. You're going down to a water closet. Usually there's a bathtub over here, sink or something like that. Again. 
you're not required to have this next to a wall. All of these diagrams show a wall next to it. Inside the unit, that's not required. In the common area, you are required to mount grab bars on a wall. And that wall is required to be 18 inches from the center line of the water closet. Within the unit, you're not required to have a wall. So these diagrams are a little misleading. We can have a tub here. In fact, we showed diagrams of that earlier. All right? But I'm required to have at the water closet a space that is 50, clear space that's 56 inches deep, 48 inches wide. Now I can have a vanity protruding into that. Okay? But it still has to provide, it can't protrude so much that I, I've got to have at least 33 inches of wall space behind that water closet. And my water closet has to be mounted with at least 18 inches opposite the approach, 18 inches from the center line to uh, clearance opposite the approach. So if I've got a bathtub over here, that bathtub has to be at least 18 inches away from the center line. If I've got a wall, it has to be at least 18 inches away from the center line. And on the other side of that, I have to have at least 15 inches, in this case, to the vanity. That gives me 33 inches of clear space around that water closet, which allows me to approach and transfer onto that water closet. Now, the guidelines do not talk about this depth. How deep can this be? The design manual does and says that this can't be any greater than 24 inches deep. Okay. So if you're building some sort of modesty partition, you can put a modesty, par modesty partition around that water closet, but it can't be more than 24 inches out from that back wall. All right? Now, if you have a door that enters opposite the water closet, let's say I've got a bedroom here and I've got a, uh, a corridor out here, I can come in from a door from the corridor and get to this water closet, or I can come in from the bedroom and get to this water closet, this bathroom from through the bedroom. This 56 inch dimension now goes to 66 inches. All right? If the door is opposite the water closet, that dimension goes to 66 inches. That dimension is greater than the tub length. All right? So sometimes this is problematic. If I want to have a door opposite the water closet, and I want to get a bathtub that is regulating the width of this thing, I can go as low as 56 inches, but look, I got to have a 60 inch clear space here and no vanity in there. So I can't have this, and I can't have this. So you have options. You have options. But understand the clear floor space requirements when you start laying out your bathrooms. Any questions about this? This is both spec A and spec B. We just went through this. This is where the 24 inch maximum comes in their sinks. Sixty inches clear, no lag, that's fine. Bathtubs and showers. This is spec A. If I have a parallel approach, that's fine. It only has to provide my 30 inch width and it has to be at least 60 inches long. Okay, if it's a parallel approach. I can have a wall mounted laboratory in that space. That's okay. This is the most common design. And so this is a perpendicular approach to the tub. That's fine. I've got my 30 by 48 inch clear flushes. This is 48 inches and this is 30 inches. Now I will tell you that this bathtub, and you guys know this, from finished surface to finished surface is not 60 inches wide. It's less than 60 inches wide. It could be that finished surface to that finished surface could be as low as 58 inches, even though you have a 60 inch tub in there. Because the tub is the flange that goes to the outside, uh, the far side. Your wall finishes go on the inside of that flange. So if I've got half inch chip board or five inch chip board and a quarter inch tile on either side of this, I'm going to be less than 60 inches. Okay? So if this is generating, if that width is generating this, the width of this space, and I have, let's, uh, I have a, let's say, 30 inch water closet here, and I've got an inch space behind that, so I, the end of my water closet is 31 inches out from this wall. 
And let's say I've got 59 inches from here to here. What's my dimension from there to there? 28 inches. How do I get a 30 by 48 inch clear floor space here? And you're not going to find a diagram of this anywhere. So word to the wise. Be very, very careful understanding where your water closet goes and what the width of this room has to be. Some of the diagrams we're going to see have a little two inch return here. And that's what that two inch return is all about, is to build in a little extra space. Because you're not going to get a 30 inch water closet in a 60 inch wide space if that 60 inch wide space is, is, regular, is, is because the tub is 60 inches wide. Because that final finish is going to be, take that space to be a little less than 50, uh, 60 inches wide. So be careful of that. Here's our parallel, pro, or our parallel approach to the tub for spec A. That's fine. There's our perpendicular approach. Again, I'm talking about you got to have at least 30 inches from here to here. <coughs> be careful. Forward approach. Now, spec B, different specification. We're required to have a parallel approach and the, foot, and the feet of the 30 by 40 inch clear floor space required to be at the foot of that, uh, at, the, at, the, at the control wall. All right. So make sure it is. Can the valves be on either side of the tub? The valves and the controls are not regulated in the unit by the Fair Housing Act. They can be anywhere. I wouldn't put them on the ceiling. They can be anywhere. Right. I see this a lot, where we have a shower, and we do not have that 12 inches. Remember, this is my 30 by 40 inch space. This is a 36 inch wide shower. Got to have 12 inches from there to there. I've seen it where I've got the, the control wall in this and the 12 inches on this side, where there's a, blank, there's a wall goes all the way across there. Can't do that. You got to have 12 inches behind the bench to get that transfer. This is the powder room. If this powder room is multi, in a primary entry level, multi-level uh, unit in an elevator served building, then that clear floor space I just talked about at the vanity and at the water closet are required to be provided. This is the only time that the water closet, uh, a, a powder room, triggers the clear floor space of the fixtures. When it's the primary, the, 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 the only bathing fixture on the primary entry level of multi-level unit in an elevator served building. If all powder rooms are required to have compliant doors, all powder rooms are required to have environmental controls in accessible locations that we talked about. All right, can anybody point out problems with this? I'll start what I did before. Take a quick look at this. You guys over here, what do you see? What's that? Start over? Good idea. Start over. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. Do we have clear floors? So said again, um, do, we, do you think this is, if this is a 34 inch door, do we have clear floor space for a parallel approach to this vanity? No, we don't. If we have knee space under here, can we have forward approach here if, if we have 48 inches? Yeah, we can. That's okay. Let's go into this compartment. Number one, can we have a separate compartment for the water closet, and in this case, bathing fixture. Can we have a separate compartment within a bathroom for the water closet? Yes. That's totally separate. Yep, you sure can. But you're going to have to provide all of this clear floor space. They, whoever did this said, yeah, I know, we can have a separate compartment. But I got to have a 30 by, if this is going to be a type A, I got to have 48 inches here for perpendicular approach, right? I got to have a clear floor space around this water closet. You got to take all of that into consideration. You can have separate compartments, but each compartment has to comply with the clear floor space for the fixtures that are in that compartment. So we don't have that 48 inch wide by 56 inch deep. If I have a if I have a single compartment, then that, and with a water closet in, 
I don't have to, it's not like the ADA where I have to provide a turning radius in there, but I have to provide the 48 by 56 inch clear floor space within that compartment. So let's take a look at some sample designs. We've seen this guy a million times. This is a very, very small type A bathroom with a door on the side. I mean, that's tiny, but it's big enough to get in, get your space here, come, get your perpendicular space here. We're not required to have a 60 inch turning diameter in there within these units. Within the units, you are in the common areas, but not at the units. We're just required to have the clear floor space. So here's our clear floor space at the lab, forward approach. Here's our cl clear floor space at the tub. This is our, and we're gonna have a perpendicular pump, and this is our clear floor space at the water closet. They can all overlap, that's fine. Two laboratories, one is required to be compliant, all right? If I had 24 inches from here to here, I could use that as a side approach. But this is a fairly small vanity, so we're gonna do forward approach to this. So this can be 15 inches from this point to this point. But I gotta have that 48 inches coming out the back here, all right? Again, all the clear floor spaces. When you're laying out these, understand what your floor, clear floor space requirements are and put them right on the drawing. And there's our compartmentalized. So we need 48 inches here. You can do it, it's fine, but you have to provide the necessary clear floor space. If this is an A bathroom, well, I'm required to have a parallel approach to, I'm not required to have at least approach. This is perpendicular and this is parallel. I'm a little concerned about this wall extending out beyond the face of that uh, vanity for a, par fair, for a parallel approach. I mean, a half inch, okay. Three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch. Nah, if that dimension from the end of this partition to the face of that vanity is more than a half an inch, I'd write it up, all right? So be careful, be careful. B bathroom, very simple B, clear floor space beyond the swing of the door, toes up against the wall, looks good. This is another very small B bathroom, but we've got, we've got a wet wall on three different walls. You don't see that very often, all right? And what, what do you notice in here? There's no requirement to turn around. So to get to this, this guy had to back into this space. I, don't think that's, I don't think that's allowed. You know, I, if I was in charge of these, I, I don't know if I would have allowed this, but. Isn't that true in parking? In what? Isn't that true in several of these? Not really. You don't have to back into the space. Everything I've showed you so far is that 30 by 40 inch clear floor space and a type B for is forward, is forward. bathroom with a shower. Here's our 30 by 48 inch clear floor space beyond the swing of the door. We shut the door and now we can back into that space and have our 12 inch op uh, back here once we've closed the door. Mini powder room. Again, this is a mini powder room that's in that long description. Powder rooms are not required to have clear floor space unless they are multi-level, high-rise, elevator served. But they still are required to have compliant doors. All doors are re required to be compliant. They're required to be on an accessible route, and they uh, are required to have environmental control in accessible locations. And there's our resources. So if you don't have those resources, that's it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes how we do time-wise. We have seven minutes to go. No, it's 3.30. No, it's 4.30. Yeah, we have seven minutes if anybody wants to ask seven minutes worth of questions, and then I'm throwing you out. No, I'll stick around as long as you want to answer any questions, all right? But if you have no questions, thank you very much. Make sure you turn in your evaluation sheets. Thank you.